Hashem Hashem Naseh Venatzliach, Shiur Torah, Baruch Hashem, glad to be in Sunny Isles. Ishtabach uh, Shimo, we uh, have a, uh, another week started. Unfortunately, we uh, started the week with Psorot Raot, the Kashot, that uh, the, the father of one of the Gdolea Mezakea Rabim, uh, the father of Rav Mizrahi, uh, David Ben Yosef Mizrahi, uh, was Niftar on Matzei Shabbat. So uh, this uh, shiur will be for Ilu Nishmato. Also, just as a uh, heads up, from now on, also all of the shiurim will also be for Ilu Nishmato. Ilu Nishmat, David Ben Yosef Mizrahi. Um, with a son like that, with a son like Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, and how many uh, people he's done shuva, it's, uh, my Rav Rabbi Ephraim told me, it almost has nothing to worry about. But uh, the reality is that everyone can always get higher and higher in Gan Eden Bezad Hashem and have an easier judgment and a uh, Bezad Hashem, a better one. Also, the shiur will be for Ilui uh, Nishmat Amir Ben Natan and uh, for Refuah Shlema for Avi Mori, David Ben Nasriya, uh, Doris Bajora, uh, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Levana Bat Sarah. Dvora bat Mercedes, Elisheva Chaya bat Elisheva Chaya bat Sara, Yochevet bat Batya, and all of Am Yisrael Bezrat Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. Now, this past week we uh, finished Parashat Veichi. We completed Parashat Veichi which also meant that we completed the uh, Sefer Bereshit. Sefer Bereshit was a uh, Sefer HaMusar. It's a, uh, anyone that learns the Midot of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Avotenu HaKdoshim, can become a decent human being. We're starting now Sefer Shmot, and it's a, uh, known among the sages that this begins the period of Shovavim. Shovavim is uh, the acronym of each one of the parashot in Sefer Shemot, the Exodus, the book of Exodus. Each one of the parashot starts with one of the letters to spell out the word Shovavim, which means like troublemakers, which comes from the Pasuk, where Hashem says, Shuvu Shovavim. He tells the troublemakers, meaning Am Yisrael, to come back. To come back, but specifically, Chazal tell us, specifically when it comes to the sin of sex crimes. Specifically when it comes to the sin of Gilu Arayot, wasting seed, immodesty, all of the things that have to do with that. This is a special time to uh, reevaluate ourselves when it comes to these specific issues. Any person that has overcome the sin of uh, wasting seed is Raui Likoldaim Tzadik. Any person who has gotten to the point where he doesn't waste seed anymore, not only he doesn't waste seed on purpose, I'm talking about, that's for, of course, I'm talking about he got to a point where he doesn't waste seed at night, meaning even accidental. He doesn't waste seed accidentally, he's Raui Likoldaim Tzadik. That's a real Tzadik. That's where Yosef Tzadik got his name. That's where Yosef HaTzadik got his name. Somebody like that, if he comes over your house, you can tell everybody, Tzadik Balayil. Somebody like that, that's a person you should ask for him for a blessing. Why? Because that's a person that overcame what the Rambam says is the most difficult obstacle in human nature to overcome. Once you become addicted to wasting seed, it's almost impossible to overcome. Not impossible, but almost impossible, not to discourage anyone and not to even give them an excuse to continue. But it, what the Rambam is trying to teach us is that, first and foremost, you should know that it's very, very difficult to overcome this addiction. So if you don't have it yet, don't be a fool. Don't be one of those people who's like, oh, only once, only once, I'm only going to try once. Because there's no such thing as one time. Second thing is that if you've, dis- if you've realized, Be'ezat Hashem, if you've watched our other shiurim about this topic, or you're going to watch tonight's shiur, Be'ezat Hashem, 
and you realize that you have a very, very serious problem with heaven, and you want to fix it, don't expect to fix it in a week. Don't beat yourself up if it's not fixed within a month. Meaning, you have to work on it. If you fail, pick up, try again, again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until it's finished. This may take a little bit more time than other things because this is both a spiritual and a physical addiction. It's not like other things where, for example, somebody that eats too much, that's purely a physical addiction. It's purely a physical addiction. He loves food more than he loves other things. When it comes to money, people love money sometimes more than their own life. The Ma says it. But still, there's more of physicality than spirituality. But when it comes to seed, this is both a physical and a spiritual disease. But it's a disease that's curable by yourself. You don't need drugs for it. You don't need to go to a psychiatrist. In fact, you shouldn't go to a psychiatrist because they'll just tell you to continue. Because they think, in their opinion, for the most part, they believe it's healthy. Even though there's proven scientific research that has proven that it's actually the opposite, they still claim the same thing. Just like, for example, some people that still believe that they came from monkeys, they still use, use research of certain scientists that were proven to be scam. The certain scientists that tried to prove Darwin's theory, but it was proven that all of their work was one big scam, like they have made it up, it was a complete scam. But yet their work is still found in textbooks today over a hundred years later. So the reality is, Rabotai Karim, is that even though sometimes the doctors, the scientists, the professors and the like know that something is wrong, and even sometimes the rabbi knows that something is wrong, they're going to tell you, no, no, it's not a big deal, it's not for our generation. It's too much for you. You can't handle it. You should know there's only one reason why they all do it. They all waste seed. They're all addicted to it. And you're making them feel bad about themselves by telling them that there's something wrong. So since you're the patient, in essence, you're under them, they'll tell you, no, no, I know much better than you. Look at my wall. I have plaques. I don't even have wallpaper. I only have plaques. My name has three or four acronyms after it and two before. My business card had to be expanded because of so many degrees that I have. Of course I'm better than you. If I say it's good, it's good. Yeah, but there's research that proves it's bad. Ah, research, research. Yeah, but that's what you said you used. Yeah, my research is different. But Shuchan Aruch says it's the worst sin in the Torah. Yeah, Shuchan Aruch, Shuchan Aruch. We don't always psak like Shuchan Aruch. Who do we psak like? We psak like the generation. They'll start telling you all types of shtuyot to make you feel good about yourself. But in reality, it's to make themselves feel good about themselves. This is also the same reason when it comes to other types of crimes against the Torah. For example, when people defend Christianity, people like Dweck, Shem Reshaim Yerkav, or Mirvis, the head rabbi of London, Shem Reshaim Yerkav. These people defend Christianity. Why? They're both on the board of directors of a Christian Jewish organization that I'm sure funds millions of dollars into their private accounts. The reality is, Rabotai, no one says something for no reason. There has to be a motivation. That's human nature. But human nature is something that you could overcome. Once you admit that you're wrong. If you don't admit that you're wrong, then we've already failed before we started. Now for all of the women that think that this is really, this shoe is not for me. I don't have such a problem. You should know that you should listen to this shoe at least as much as every guy, maybe even more. And the reason why is because, number one, the same initiative, the same evil act, according to the Torah, that seems innocent, is also not allowed for women. More importantly, 99% of guys don't purely do things based on their imagination. They do things based on something they saw. That's why the Gemara in Masechet Avodah Zarah says, watch your eyes in the morning 
So you don't come to evil at night. Mephoshim say, what is evil? Evil is wasting seed. So anytime a woman walks around immodestly, she should know there's a very good chance that at least one guy is going to look at her. More likely it's every guy. But let's just give it, let's be conservative. She walks down the street, she wants to go buy a bagel from the kosher store. And she decides that the kosher store that's down the street, it's only 10 minutes from the house, is the perfect one. So she's going to walk in nice high heels to make sure that everybody knows every single step she walks, they can hear her, they can see her, and they can notice her. And she also makes sure that the skirt just barely covers her thighs, let alone doesn't even reach the knees. Or maybe she's going to wear something that's tight enough that you're not going to know if it's her skin or it's pants. We're not really sure. It's just a different color. You can't really tell. Maybe she had a really good suntan. Anyway, she's going to arrive at the store, and along the way, Pablos and Mikael and Alexander and Stevie and Amos and Joey, all of them, what are they? They're blind. They see. They see this pretty woman that just looks like she came from uh, Gan Eden. She's walking down the street. They say, ah, look how beautiful you made things for me to see Hashem. They start making brachot for it. They start, all of a sudden, they remember all Masechet Brachot, they do Brachot for everything they name him, everything they enjoy. And they're going to look at her, even if it's for two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. That's just enough time to record her picture in their mind eternally. Not for the week, not for the month, forever. Sefer Hasidim says... There are some poskim that say once the guy looks at her and starts imagining things, it's as if he was intimate with her. Like in Shamaim, it's oh look, he just made Avira Hashem. What did he do? He was just with her. What they didn't touch. In Shamaim they consider as if they touched. The point being Abutai, now she has Joey looked at her, then Steve, then Pablo's, then Pablo's told everybody else, all the workers that are working construction, everybody look, do 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 one after another, it's a domino effect. Everybody saw her go get a bagel. And they can't wait for her to get out after they get the bagel. Now they're going to think about her in the most inappropriate ways, in the most inappropriate times, and every single time they look at her, it's a sin from the Torah, and they create a demon. If they actually go to the point of imagining her during a time where they think that they're doing themselves a favor, they're creating millions of demons and every single time they create demons those same amount of demons go into her account they create one one appears right next to her they create two two appear next to her they create a hundred million welcome a hundred million we'll make sure we fit you into the house this rabotai is a very very simple explanation for what the gemara says in Masechet Chulin, page 7b, there's not a person that gets an injury on his finger down here without being decided up there. Meaning, a person needs to understand. Hashem is so careful with every single move, every single thing that happens, there is no way on God's green earth that someone could hurt even their finger. Get a little pricked on their finger from the rose he bought for his wife on Friday. It's a mitzvah. But he got hurt a little bit. In Shemaim, there was a whole bedin. They had a whole bedin organized. Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, everybody gathered. Okay, we have a judgment. What? We're going to decide right now. Very serious judgment. Is he going to get hurt from the rose? And a little blood's going to come out. Yes or no? Favor, favor, favor. Unanimous. Let him do it. Let him get hurt. Meaning, for the rose. Now, I'm not talking about car accidents, robberies, death, sickness. I'm not talking about such big things. We don't have to go so far. We don't have to go so far, Abutai. Something small, the Gemara says. A little blood left his finger. Somebody hit him on the side by accident. Somebody elbowed him by accident. He twisted his ankle. The nail fell off. 
tooth hurts a little bit. In Shemaim, there was a whole bedin. They got together and said, guilty. Guilty. For what? No, shh. Cheshbon that he has. The accounting that he has in Shemaim. This means, Rabotai, that any time a woman wakes up in the morning on Tisha B'Av, she's depressed, she's annoyed, but nothing really happened yet. She can't find a zivug. She starts seeing there's a lot of hair coming out. She's going bald, but she's only 35. She doesn't know what's happening. Everybody tells her it's stress. The other people tell her, change shampoo. The other people tell her, maybe, maybe it's the sun. No one knows what's going on, but everybody likes to throw their opinion. Because opinions are free. She doesn't know what's going on. All of a sudden, there's something on the side. All of a sudden, the doctor calls and says, please come to my office without giving her an explanation. Then she comes to the office and says, listen, we saw growth. We don't know what it is. We need to investigate it. Life becomes scary. She should know. Before all of that happened, in Shemaim, they had a bed din. Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, all of the tzaddikim. What do you think? They just hang out do nothing? Yet a bedin. Do we give her something to get scared about or no? So, the Torah tells us that there's no such thing as a righteous person who doesn't sin. Everybody sins. So why does the Torah still call him righteous? If he sins, he should be called a rasha, no? He says, no, no. There's no such thing as a tzaddik shelo ichta. He's righteous, but he sins. So why is he still a tzaddik? Because he doesn't do it on purpose. He's a tzaddik, but he makes sins, but it's not on purpose. Something slipped over here, slipped over there, word came out that's not appropriate, looked somewhere not appropriate a second, and then looked at, he's not doing it on purpose. She's not wearing the immodest clothes on purpose, knowing that Hashem hates it. She's not doing it. She doesn't know. Her mom bought her clothes. She wears the mom. Her mom bought her clothes. I went to a playground. Hashem Yachem. You go to a playground. You can't even go. You go to a playground. You start seeing people. Hashem Yachem. You have to go back home. You could only go when there's nobody there. Why? Everybody thinks. Everybody forgets their clothes at home. These are the most religious people. And even when they come, you're not even even sure you're allowed to be there. Why? Because their six-year-old is barely barely wearing underwear and a, and a tank top. Even if the mom remembered some of her clothes, the kid forgot the clothes, or the mom didn't buy any clothes. She bought her a tank top that you're supposed to go to sleep with, maybe. And she goes out, she walks around like this. Religious people. Religious people, I saw a couple of people. The father had a longer beard than I think some of the Gdoleado. But his daughter, I don't think that I would let my kids shower with those clothes. Mamas, Rabotai, I don't understand what happened to us. I don't understand what happened to Am Yisrael that we simply forgot that modesty is important. We forgot. Well, we're here to announce once and for all it's important. It's so important that if a woman is not modest, it's impossible for her to go to Gan Eden. Meaning, even if she fulfills all of the mitzvot, Shabbat, Tarat Mishpacha, she eats kosher, Badat, she orders it specially from Israel just to make sure the Shechita is the best, and so on and so forth. If she's not modest, it's impossible for her to enter Gan Eden. And the reason why is because when she arrives to the Bedin of Shamaim, all of the victims of her crimes also show up. Who are the victims? Carlos and Stephen and Amos, and Pablos, and all of the guys that were looking how to go buy a bagel. They also show up. It's like, Hashem, you're, I'm in Gehenom. Why is she going to Gan Eden? He says, you're right. Join them. Why? They sinned. They saw you one time for 20 seconds. That was enough for them to sin for 20 years. Even when they were with their wife. So Rabotai Karim, the sin of wasting seed, immodesty, the whole issue that we're supposed to talk about tonight, the whole issue we're supposed to do tshuva for during these weeks, during our lifetime, during as soon as possible, 
is as much relevant to women as it is to men. Because we're both partners in the crime. Now we've talked about some of the things about how terrible it is in the eyes of Hashem. We'll go over some of those things just so people get a clear picture. But more importantly, we're going to go over some new things. Some new things that we haven't gone over before of how to fix it. Tikkun Abrit. Now before we go over fixing it, we have to understand the magnitude of the sin. And the reason why is because if I told you, listen, you really shouldn't eat this burger. Why? It's fattening. It's like, all right, thank you. You know what? It's pretty good. I'll take the fat. Give me another one. Why? Because you don't care about getting fat. You don't care. Nobody cares. You, tell burger, you, you like the delicious burger much more than you like being, caring about being fat. Thank you very much. Some people know. Some people won't eat it. But for the most part, if people like food, they'll eat it anyway. If I tell you, you know what? Don't buy from this guy. He, uh, I don't think his, uh, his, his, his stuff is proven to be fake. He sells fake goods. Sometimes people say, ah, you know, I'll take the chance. Why? I like the price. I like the price. His, uh, he sells bags 90% off. Any other store, I buy it for $1,000. In this store, it looks exactly the same. It's only uh, $100. So let it be fake. I don't care. I, uh, I'll take the chance. Meaning, you like the discount too much. So if I give you an example like that, you're not going to do chuba. Why? Because you're going to say, eh, it's not it's a sin. So there's a lot of things are a sin. Lashonara is a sin. Show me one person that's not saying Lashonara. Some people say, if it wasn't for Lashonara, what would I talk about? If I, didn't have, if I couldn't say Lashonara, what else am I going to talk about? There's nothing to say, Kvod Arav, no? Lashonara, were you trying to kill me? Kill me now already, I can't say Lashonara. Bemet, some people are so addicted to talking that they have to say Lashonara. They have to. Eventually they're going to realize it was a mistake, but we'll have a different shield for them. Anyway, Rabotai Karim, it's important for us to know the magnitude of the sin with clear examples of what the Torah says to show you that it's not just a burger that's going to help you gain weight and grow a little more. It's not just maybe the goods are fake. It's make it or break it. There are a few things in the Torah that are called the biggest sins in Judaism. People get confused. People think that when they see the Rambam writes that somebody that cheats in business, midot, midot meaning when you weigh, you weigh goods. Let's say, for example, you're, uh, somebody wants to buy a one pound or a hundred pounds of sugar from you, and you mess with the scale that in reality he's buying 50 pounds of sugar instead of a hundred, but he's paying for a hundred. You tilt the scale. The Rambam says it's harder to do tshuva for this than gilu'i arayot, than sex crimes. So people, the heretics, like Yonatan Levi, Machshimo Vezichro, or his friends that run the anti-rabbis, anti-Torah pages on the internet, they say, look, see, these, uh, these rabbis don't know what they're talking about. The Rambam himself says, that Gilu uh, Ariot sex crimes is not such a big deal because if you're still in business, it's much worse. All this proves is they don't know how to read. That's all it is. That's all it proves. They don't know how to read. And probably didn't go to Yeshiva and everything he says on the internet that he studied with Rabbi Peretz and all of the other people simply didn't happen. I would be surprised if they even know him. What the Rambam is clearly saying, if you check every source, is that to do tshuva for wasting seed is much easier than for stealing. Doing tshuva for stealing is much more difficult than doing tshuva for wasting seed. Why? Because when a person wastes seed and he decides to do tshuva, practically speaking, not the whole aspect of it, just practically speaking, what is it? He decides to stop. That's it. Finished. He stops. He stops. I'm sorry, Hashem. Finished. That's tshuva. There's obviously other steps, but in essence, practically speaking, what steps he has to take, s- decide, stop, finished. When it comes to stealing a botai, it's not so easy. Why? 
Let's say you stole $100,000, but then you feel bad. You feel bad about it. It's like, oh, you know, I shouldn't steal. You know what? I'm going to do tshuva. Chatanu, avinu, pashanu. I'm not stealing anymore. Good for you. You're not stealing anymore. You're still a thief. You still cannot enter Gan Eden. What do you mean? But I stopped stealing. You stopped stealing, but you still have to make up for the money you stole. Yeah, but I spent it already. Too bad. Until you return every penny you stole, you cannot enter Gan Eden. What if I don't have it? Too bad for you. Should have thought about it before you stole. That's why Kashayotir. That's why it's more difficult to sin of stealing than of Gilu Arayot. Because most of the time, by the time you realize you have to do tshuva for stealing, you've already spent the money. And to go get it back, you don't even know how to. You're so used to stealing. The Shulchan Aruch calls wasting seed the biggest sin in the Torah. But it also calls Chilul Shabbat the biggest sin in the Torah. And many other places in the Torah call other things the biggest sin in the Torah. What does it mean, biggest sin in the Torah? What is there? If biggest usually means there's one. What does it mean? This, in essence, means these are sins that it's not necessarily this is the one thing that is the bigger than everything else. Is that it's part of the 36 sins that if you commit them and don't do tshuva, it doesn't matter even if you keep the entire Torah. You still don't enter Gan Eden. You have no share of the world to come. Yeah, but I kept Shabbat. Good for you. You still have no share of the world to come. We'll pay you for Shabbat. Yeah, but I, uh, I did this and I, I gave Stakah. Good for you. Thank you very much. You still don't know it. There are 36 sins like this. That if a person does not do tshuva for them while he's alive, he has no share of the world to come. What about all the mitzvot that he did? Hashem will pay him cash. Meshalem el sonav el panav le'avido. He pays him cash to his face to destroy him. Why? He made the sin without doing tshuva. You cannot enter Gan Eden. So when it says that wasting seed is the biggest sin in the Torah, it's not as in essence saying it's bigger than Chilul Shabbat or it's bigger than you know lending another Jew money and charging him interest. It's in essence saying it's, it's part of the same group, that if you violate it, it's as if you violated the entire Torah. So these are sins you simply have to do everything possible to avoid. Especially avoid them on purpose. So many, just to say it clearly so you wake up, it's better you die than make these sins. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? It's better if somebody gets really hot and he can't control himself, it's better he dies than waste seed on purpose. According to the Torah, not Yaron Uven. Yaron Uven wants you to do Tshuva. Meaning that a person can never get to a point of thinking, oh, it's okay, it's hard for me. No, you have to do tshuva. I'm not saying go commit suicide, chas shalom. What I'm saying to you is you have to do tshuva for it. You have to do tshuva for it. You have to do tshuva for it. There's no other way. You have to do tshuva for it. There's no get out of jail free card with all the tzedakah you're going to give, with all the good that you did, and so on and so forth. doesn't make a difference. You have to do tshuva for it. There's a lot of information I'm going to cover. I'm probably going to answer your questions. So the Gemara in Masechet Chulin says that you should know, you should know very, very clearly. Bat Israel, Ben Israel, you should know. If something is happening in your life, it's Hashem talking to you. There was a Bet Din in Shemaim. They decided, they agreed, you deserve it. Whether for good or for bad, you deserve it. Sometimes it's for good. Immediately, sometimes it looks like it's bad, but it's good eventually. Either way, nothing happens for no reason. Now, Shlomo HaMelech says something very, very interesting. He says in Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 16, Dvash matzata echol dayeka. Pentis be'ena ve'ikiyato. Shlomo Melech is teaching us a little bit about dieting. He says, if you found honey, found honey, don't eat too much. Why? If you eat too much, you're going to throw up. Now, does anybody here actually think for a second that the wisest man of all time is really giving you diet advice? 
the Chachamim explain Dvash is a woman. The most beautiful woman in the world it can be. It can even be your wife that's mutaralecha, that she's allowed to you. You found something beautiful. You, you found something wonderful. You like it? Good. Don't do too much. Why? If you do it too much, eventually you're going to hate it. You're going to throw up. You're going to vomit. Meaning, even with your wife, you're not allowed to be together with too often. There are times to be, there are times not to be. Obviously, we have part of the reason of why Hashem gave us Tarat Mishpacha, family purity, is to give each marriage a break when it comes to intimacy and focus on spirituality. This is one of the hidden secrets of Am Yisrael's low, low divorce rate, virtually non-existent divorce rate throughout history. Why? We're not like the Goim, that pretty much at any given opportunity, we uh, pretend like we're alone and there's not 500 people watching us, even though we're in the mall. The reality is, Rabotai, is that when a woman is nida, her own, her own husband is not allowed to even hold her hand. In fact, one of the most difficult things for me personally to understand was how is it possible to not hold your wife's hand right after, or at least hug her or something, right after she gave birth. Why? She becomes Nida. As soon as the water breaks, she's Nida. You're not allowed to touch her. And all the movies, Hashem and Hashem Aleinu, that we watched our whole life, the first thing you do, the wife gives birth, honey, I love you, I love you. You saw some movie said it. Judaism, not allowed to touch a finger after she gave birth. Not allowed to touch a finger. Forget hug, kiss, everything. Not allowed to touch a finger. This was hard for me when I first started doing tshuva. Why? I didn't understand the magnitude of the sin. I didn't understand what does it mean, nida. Shem yachem nida. It's not something wrong with her. It's part of the makeup of a woman. It's part of the makeup of the world. It's also part of what makes her special, holy, amazing. A person doesn't understand these things. You can easily say, no, this one doesn't make any sense. I'm going to pass on this one. And then arrive in Shamaim and they say, yes, uh, sir, this uh, department over there, you see the good one? Yeah, you're not going there. You're going the other place. Why? You gave your wife a kiss. Why? It's a mitzvah, no? Not during the time you did it. It's a mitzvah when it's allowed. A Torah tells us there are only specific times that you're allowed to touch your wife, but it's specifically because we have to know how to control ourselves. A person that does not know how to control himself is no different than an animal. He's no different than a donkey. He's no different than a dog. He's no different than a lion. He's no different than any animal that the Goyim like to hunt and put it on their walls, like some of my former clients used to do. I had a client who was a spinal surgeon from Texas. For fun, he used to hunt animals and then pull them on his wall. In Shamaim, a person that violates Tikkun Abrit, violates Tikkun Abrit, they also put them on the wall. They do. It says in Rishit Chochmah, they put them on the wall. The only difference is the animal's dead. The guy's still alive. It says, ah, you liked hunting, didn't you? <coughs> it's important we know these things because the sin is so big, I'm too scared not to tell you. I'm too scared you arrive in Shamayim 120 years and they're going to tell you, oh, well, we're really sorry. What are we really sorry? I went to Shul every week. Three times a week I went. Yeah, we're really sorry you went and never heard it. I went to Yeshiva. I went to Kolel. I went to Kotel. I went to everywhere. I went to Mekubal. We're sorry. You went to a lot of places and spent all that time, but you never learned the truth. So Shlomo HaMelech tells us, Dvash Matzata, you have to be careful. You have to be careful with how comfortable you are with your body. You have to be careful with how comfortable you are with your wife. Also, this helps improve marriages both physically and spiritually. That when you know that there's a specific time to be together, to hold hands, to eat together, and so on and so forth, you're going to appreciate that time and value it much more than your average celebrity that gets divorced at least five to six times in their life 
because they had uh, such freedom, they call it. But wasting seed and in general immodesty is one of those sins where even if you know it's wrong, it's very hard to do tshuva. The Rambam, as I told you, says this is the hardest thing to overcome. He said it about wasting seed. The Gemara also says that immodesty is a very difficult thing for women. Why? Women like attention. Sometimes they don't get enough attention from their husband, or they get the wrong attention from their husband, or their father, or their mother, or their girlfriend, whoever it is. Somebody influences them, and they have a very hard time starting to put clothes on because they want to get attention. They like how Steve looked at them and started whistling. They like how Will down the street always looks at her and winks. They like how everybody stops talking when she crosses the street. She feels like she's Moshe Rabbeinu. She's crossing the ocean. She likes it. She likes the attention. Who doesn't like attention? That's the problem. It's very hard to overcome even if you know it's wrong. What's the Pasuk say about it? Shlomo HaMelech again in chapter 26 says, Kekelev shav al kiyo. Like a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool repeat his foolishness. Now, until I had a dog, I never understood this pasuk. Why? Because you read this pasuk, Shlomo Melech says, wait, a dog returns to his vomit? Why? Once you have a dog, you realize, yes, he does. Dog can eat something. He can pretty much, dogs are like uh, a living garbage disposal. <coughs> they can eat anything. But once in a while, it goes down the wrong tube, so they vomit it. It goes the wrong tube, they ate too fast, they ate whatever it is. They vomit it. It's completely disgusting. They walk away, they look around. Oh, you did it? No, no, you're the one that did it. They look at the owner. Like, you did it? No, no, you did it. Oh, okay, so I'm going to eat it. This is good. They go back and eat it. Every dog. It's not just my dog, old dog, this dog. No, no, no. Every dog. My dog died about two, three years ago. The reality is, Rabotai, the dog comes back to his vomit, even though it's disgusting. Why? He's a dog. That's the difference. But Shlomo Melech says, when a person knows that a sin is not allowed when a person knows that a sin is hurting his relationship, hurting her relationship with Hashem Barach, hurting their relationship with their spouse, hurting their chances to find a zivug, hurting their financial situation, hurting their life, hurting their olam haba, hurting their olam hazeh, and he still goes back to it, he's a fool, just like the dog she's a fool just like the dog she's no different than a dog he's no different than a dog he comes back to his vomit she comes back to a vomit you heard it's not allowed yeah but i like my mini skirt okay so you're like a dog don't be scared don't be upset when they call you a dog in shamayim hey doggy come on come to gain home come come let's go come yeah but i was a butt israel you should treat me with respect you were a Bat Yisrael. We treated you with respect until you treated yourself like a dog. Once you treat yourself like a dog, what do you want from us? You did it. We told you not allowed. Now what's going to help us, Rabotai? There's a very famous thing that people like to say all the time. Tshuva, tefillah, v'tzdakah, ma'avirin et roa gzera. Hashem irachem alenu, so many difficult decrees we have on Am Yisrael every week somebody dies every week there's an Asson every week there's some type of disaster somebody grows some type of thing in their body that's not supposed to be there every day there's some type of accident terrorism Shem Yerachem on Am Yisrael how many Asonot are happening in, in, in just on a daily basis it's almost like you want to put yourself in a cave disconnect from all media all news all anything and just say you know Hashem I don't want to hear it anymore it's just too much bad news people say oh why is Hashem doing this why is Hashem doing this how do we overcome this decree 
So, Chazal told us, Tshuva, Tfila, Vetztaka, Ma'avirin, Etro, Akzera. Doing Tshuva, doing Tfila, praying, and giving Tztaka. And the Chafetz Chaim clarified what this means. Because a lot of people think they did Tshuva. Because they started keeping Shabbat. But they still walk around immodest. They still steal from their partner. They still steal from their customers. But they, they're for sure that they did Tshuva. Their kids don't even know Dalif Bet. They're 12 years old, 13 years old, but they think they did Tshuva yet. They themselves don't know the Aleph Bet yet because they're too busy working. Not because uh, they study, but they didn't get to it. They're too busy working, making another million because they need to get another third or fourth house. But they're sure they did Tshuva because they started keeping Shabbat and eating Chulent on Shabbat. A lot of people think they did tshuva. But tshuva is not so simple to do. You have to stop making sins. You have to commit not to return. And you have to get to a point of regretting them. Tshuva is a process that's a lifelong process that needs growth, requires growth on a daily basis. It's not one of those things you can pay attention to it maybe once or twice a month, like a phone bill. The second thing is when it comes to tefillah, many people go pray. Many people, Baruch Hashem, go pray. Some people pray at home. Some people pray, you know, with the big kneset. But if we were our own judge, let's put aside, set aside what they think about us in Shemaim, if our prayer b'chal is even counted the way we pray sometimes. If we were our own judge, we, Ramash, looked at our own prayer. And we saw how we pray in the morning. We saw how we pray in Mincha, when we're hungry and we want to go eat. You're not allowed to eat right before Mincha, so you want to pray really fast. So you go eat, because the food's hot, it's on the table. Arvit, you're not even sure if you want to do it or not, so you're like, you, you wait until you're like half asleep, like you're half a dead. You're b- between this world and the next. If we were our own judge for our prayers, Behemet, I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I don't even know why Hashem even allows us to pray. Sometimes our prayers are so terrible. The way we're supposed to pray versus the way we pray, Hashem Yachem. Sometimes I see people in Beknesset and I ask myself, why do you come? The whole time, you haven't even opened the book. Just this, this Friday. I went to a new Knesset, and I look around. I try not to look around, but sometimes you finish a little bit before everybody else or some other people. So you're just there. You're just waiting, waiting, waiting. And you're never, you're not supposed to have a look behind you because then you can make the person behind you feel bad. He didn't finish. So you're just waiting, but there's sometimes there's people next to you. You're on the right, on the left. You can't help yourself. You look at them. And I'm waiting, and I see this kid the whole time he's walking around. The whole time he's walking around. He has a do. He's maybe 15 years old. He's not like a little baby. So as he do, he's walking around, he's waiting for somebody to finish so he can talk to him. And I ask myself, why'd you come? Why'd you come? Now I can't say anything because I don't know the guy. And I'm waiting for a better moment than before Chazat Hashatz. But the reality, I see some people, all they do the whole time is talk to each other. The guy, the, the Chazan is saying Kaddish, to sanctify Hashem's name, and they're talking. It's like you invited Hashem to your house and you say, Hashem, one second, when I finish with him, I'll get to you. What are you doing with him? You're finishing something important? No, no, I just want to ask him how he's doing. See, uh, maybe he knows the score of who won the last baseball game. And then I want his opinion about the stock market. And what does he really think about the wall Donald Trump wants to build? After I finish that, Hashem, I'll get to you. Yeah, but you realize everybody else is talking about me. They're all sanctifying my name. Yeah, yeah, let them do what they want. I'll get to you in a second, Hashem. I'm busy. That's what talking during Kaddish is. It's the biggest bizayon you can possibly do. It's better a person doesn't come to the world than talk during the middle of Kaddish. The Melech Malchei Amlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You just, everyone, just the whole kila, just invited the Shekhinah to come to the Beknesset and you're busy talking to somebody else. There's no more bigger bizayon than that. How many Batei do you know of that 
people don't talk during prayer. I ask myself, why did you come? It's better off you never came. It's better off you don't even pray. At least you didn't sin. So tefillah, we need to work on it. Then it says tzedakah. Tzedakah, people give tzedakah. They see a homeless guy, they give him a dollar. Unless they have a quarter, so they give the quarter, but they feel like they're Moshe Rabbeinu, Baal tzedakah. Oh yeah, I help the homeless guy all the time. Why is he still homeless if you're helping him so much? Me, I give to the homeless guy all the time. So how come he's still homeless? If you give him all the time. Oh, I give staka to the Beknesset all the time. You do? So how come nobody keeps Shabbat in the Beknesset? Where's the money going? What's it doing? What kind of Beknesset is it? People fund all these buildings. But when it comes to actually helping people do tshuva, everyone's dumbfounded. When it comes to actually helping Bnei Torah, no, no, they, uh, they, they chose that life. Let them live. They chose to live off of $500 a month with eight kids. They chose it, so why should I, why should I uh, interfere? I want to build another building that has my name on it. I want the chandelier to say my name in laser. So our tzedakah, if you really mamash look at the tzedakah that we give, is it really tzedakah or is it marketing? So the Chafetz Chaim gave a pirush worth a million dollars. He said the following. Imagine that there was a river that was flooding and was not allowing people to cross from one side to the next. At this stage, there are only two options. One, build a temporary bridge. Two, dry the river. Now, even if you build a temporary bridge, eventually it'll collapse. Eventually, it won't hold up. That's staka. Even if you give staka to the right place, not the place that the, the rabbi drives on Shabbat. Not the place that the rabbi is bringing a Christian missionary to the shul. No, no, you gave it to the right place. Eventually, the merits from that staka are going to die. Then you use them. The bridge is going to break, the Chafetz Chaim says. Eventually it's going to break. The only solution is drying the river. That's Chuba. That's Chuba. Chuba is drying the river. And either one requires tefillah. Chuba, Tzedakah, Tefillah. In this analogy, clarifies that, yes, you need to give tzedakah, but it has to be to the right place. Yes, you need to pray, but it has to be to the right place. It has to be focused. But most importantly, if you just pray and you just give tzedakah, without tshuva, they're worthless because eventually the merit will run out. Now, there's a few things that a person needs to know about wasting seed. First and foremost, it's hated by Hashem. The Gemara Masechet Nida, page 16b, says that each time a seed leaves the body of the man, there's a malach that goes to Hashem and asks Hashem, what should I do with this? This malach's name is Laila. And this malach takes the seed to Hashem Barach, to the Kisea Kavod, and he talks about all of the potential of this seed. This seed could be the biggest rabbi in the world. This seed could be the Mashiach. This seed could be a Mezakeh Rabin. This seed could be Sarah Imenu. This seed could be Chana. This seed could be Rachel. This seed could be Korach. This seed has a lot of potential. 
what should I do with this one? But that's assuming that the seed is supposed to go is going in the right place. When a person misuses his seed, immediately it's known in Shamaim that this seed is going to get killed. This seed is being destroyed. And the Rambam says, anytime a man wastes seed, it is exactly, not like, it is exactly like murder. It's 100% murder. But the Gemara elaborates and says that any time that a person weighs seed, it's as if he brought the flood. Why the flood? Why not something else? Because the Gemara already knew things that we only discovered in recent generations. The flood, what did the flood do? The flood destroyed the entire world. The flood destroyed millions or billions of people. When a man wastes seed, he's also destroying hundreds of millions of souls that had a potential of being the biggest rabbi in the world, the biggest tzaddikah in the world. He is destroying hundreds of millions of them. So the Gemara already with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Chachamim, had already knew without the microscopes and the telescopes and the microphones and the iPods and the iPhones and the scientists that pretend like they know what they're talking about. Without it. But I already knew. Hashem says, you waste seed, you're bringing the flood. Flood killed millions, you're killing millions. In Shemaim, that's the deen they gave the person. Oh yeah, this person, yeah, yeah, this Steve. Yeah, Steve just murdered 300 million people today. Wake up, Steve. That was only 9 in the morning. By the time it was 5 o'clock, Steve already, uh, Steve is bored again. So he decides to kill another 300 million. And the reality is, Abutai, a person could live his whole life as a murderer and not even know it because he never saw blood. Because he doesn't realize that the essence of a person is his seed. Meaning the seed is even more significant than the blood itself. If the blood is the juice, seed is the potion that makes it, the uh, syrup that makes it. Now, some people like to make excuses. They say things like, no, this is crazy. Every guy is addicted to it. Every kid's addicted to it. No one's talking about it except you and Rabbi Mizrahi and uh, Rabbi Elona Nava and Rabbi Zitron. You guys are only four. There are thousands that don't talk about it. If it was so important, if it was really the worst thing in the world, of course my Rebbe would say it at the Kolel, at the Yeshiva, at the Beknesset. Of course my, my Rabbi is the best. My Rabbi knows more than you. My Rabbi is from, from birth. My Rabbi, he, I think he was at Mount Sinai, my Rabbi. How come he's not talking about it if it's so so bad? Maybe your rabbi knows that if he told you, it'll fall on deaf ears because you're not really interested in doing tshuva. Maybe your rabbi doesn't know himself because he focused on other aspects of the Torah and he was he fell asleep during the shiur when it came to wasting seed. Maybe your rabbi had a bad rabbi. I don't really know and I don't really care what your rabbi's excuse is. The point is it doesn't change what the Chachamim wrote. It doesn't change what Hashem wrote. It doesn't change what every halacha says. Nowhere in any halachic book in the history of Am Yisrael did anyone ever say it's permitted to waste seed. Nowhere. There's not a single Chacham that ever says you're allowed to waste seed on a regular basis. There's not a single Chacham saying that you're allowed to do it because you're addicted. You're allowed to do it because it's fun. You're allowed to do it because you're single. You're allowed to do it because you're depressed. You're allowed to do it because of whatever other stupid excuse people give you. No one ever said it's allowed. In fact, they said it's 
the worst sin in the entire Torah, the exact opposite. So much so that even before Am Yisrael received the Torah, even before Am Yisrael was even born, it was not allowed. Er and Onan, the children of Yehuda, both got killed by Hashem because they wasted seed. The entire generation of Noah got killed because they wasted seed. Neither one of them were Jewish. Neither one of them had a Torah like we do. Still, Hashem killed them on the spot because they wasted seed. Meaning that this is not only that it's forbidden from, for Jews, it's forbidden for non-Jews. It's specifically considered disgusting to, to Hashem. Now, a person that wants to continue listening to the emet, but ignoring it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, everything is true, but listen, I can't do anything about it. I'm addicted. There's a pasuk for them also. David Melech in Psalm 115, verse 17 says, kol duma. Neither the dead can praise God, nor any who descend to Duma. It says the dead people, they can't praise Hashem. They're already in Ganeden, but also who else can praise Hashem? The people that are handled by Duma. Who's Duma? It's a special malach that handles people with a lot of excuses. Oh, you can't keep Shabbat? Go to Duma. Oh, you can't stop wasting seat? Go to Duma. You can't wear modest clothes? Duma is going to handle you too. There's a Duma department. He's a malach the size of the world. He can handle many people all at the same time. The Rambam writes in Mishneh Torah, Ilchot Deot, chapter 3, Allah number 3. One should act with, sub- with subconscious feeling and intent in his heart that he should have a son. Meaning even when he is with his wife, he shouldn't just think, oh, I just want to have fun. He should have, I should have a son. He's allowed to do it. He's allowed to be with his wife even if she's pregnant and he knows he can't make her pregnant again at the same time. Or she's already old enough where she can't have kids. Still allowed. Because you're allowed to enjoy. As long as you're following the law. But still on his mind, he should always think about my seed, the intention of my seed is to have a child. Perhaps this son will be wise and great in Klal Yisrael. Whoever walks in such a path, whoever has such a mind that constantly is thinking about bringing good to the world, bringing good to Klal Yisrael, the Rambam writes, if he does it all of his days, he will be serving God constantly, even in the midst of his business dealings, even during physical intimacy. For his intent in all matters is fulfill his needs, so that his body be whole to serve God. The Rambam says a person that wants to get to a level higher than a malach, higher than an angel, all he has to do is think about God at all times, during business, but also the physical aspect. At all times. If a person is constantly thinking about what's the point of what am I doing? I'm doing business so I can make money, so I can give tzedakah, so I can feed my family, so I can do mitzvot. Okay, you're thinking about Hashem. I'm being intimate with my wife so I can bring children to the world. Why? Because I want to bring more tzaddikim to the world. There's enough reshaim. Bring tzaddikim. If you're thinking, what's the point of doing everything you're doing, you could literally become higher than a malach, higher than an angel. This is the type of thought process that a person is supposed to get to eventually. Now for all of those people that think, wait a minute, uh, you know, you realize that almost every guy is addicted. So what, Hashem is going to put everybody in Gainum? Well, we went over this also. The Gemara in Masechet Tanit, page 10a, says Gan Eden is 60 times the size of earth. Whatever the size of earth is, I'm sure some scientist has calculated exactly the size of earth. Whatever that is, time it by 60, that's Gan Eden. There's two Gan Edens. There's one here, physical, and there's one spiritual, above and beyond. That one is 60 times the size of earth. 
Genom is 60 times the size of Gan Eden. Meaning not only is it bigger than Gan Eden, it's 60 times the size of Gan Eden. But some say, no, no, it's not 60 times the size of Gan Eden. There's no size to Genom. Why? It continues to grow. Now anyone with a little bit of sechel asks themselves, why is, Gan, why is Genom continuing to grow? Is not enough? No, there's more entrance every week. Every week more people join Genom and not as many join Gan Eden. Why? Because apparently they haven't done Shuvah. This Gemara is a very simple Gemara. Anybody could read it. Anybody could see it. It's literal. It's not one of those things where you need to be a big Chacham to understand it. This is what it says. You have a problem with it? Go fight Hashem. Go fight, I don't know, fight uh, the wall. Smash your head against the wall a few times. Hopefully you get to a good solution. There's nothing I can do about this Gemara. It's what it says, Rabotai. You can't say it's figuratively speaking. It's an analogy. This is what it says. There's no other way to interpret it. Meaning that a person needs to understand all the excuses in the world to not do tshuva are not going to help a person. Why? Because you can't say, why? The Shem's going to put everybody in getting home. Apparently he is. Apparently it's happening. The key to the shiurim is for us not to be one of them. That's the point of the shiur. I promise it's not to put you to sleep. Now, when it comes to immodesty, the Gemara Masechet Sota says something very interesting. When there's an increased amount of women that are immodest, and as the Torah describes them as women with stretched necks and winking eyes, You know, the kind of women that want to get attention, either by their clothing or by their behavior. Immodesty, by the way, is not just clothes. Sometimes you have a woman with a mitpachat, you think she just came from Mount Sinai, but she's still the most immodest person on earth. I saw this woman, they called her the Rabbanit, but she talked to every single guy in the Bet Knesset, some of them she even hugged. Rabbanit, 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 Rabbanit. She had a kisu rosh, though. She had a kisu rosh, but Rabbanit, Rabbanit, everybody's our friend. The only one she didn't hug is her husband, the rabbi. Everybody else, Rabbanit, Rabbanit. She, she, she missed the shoe. Hopefully she watches. It says a person like that, that stretched neck and winking eyes, women that like attention, pe- people that do something to get your attention. She laughs like an obnoxious cow. She wants to make sure you know that she's the one laughing. She talks loud enough for the neighbors to hear. You know, some people walk around with the phone. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think? Ha, ha. You know, they make sure that the neighbors and the guys in the store, everybody listens. She wants to know. You bought it? Wow. Mabruk, Mazal Tov. Everybody knows what Mazal Tov. Who are you? Why are you talking? Are you talking to me? No, no, I'm talking to my friend. People get attention. They need attention. They need people to know what's going on in their lives. They have such emptiness. They need attention. This is an act of immodesty. And the Gemara says that when there's an increased number of women that are described as walking with stretched necks and winking eyes, the use of bitter waters of the sota should have been increased as well. Meaning that it leads to promiscuity. Meaning that it gets to a point of immorality. That immodesty eventually leads to people cheating on each other. No, I'm just, uh, I'm not, I don't, no one cheats, no one cheats. Well, proof is in the pudding. Divorces don't happen because everybody just disagrees on money. They, they, they also happen because of other things. So for anyone that thinks that his wife being immodest is not a big deal, he should know. She's immodest because you're not giving her enough attention. And if you're not giving her enough attention, you're giving the attention to somebody else. Eventually, she's going to notice it. One of you is going to do something about it. It's a race. Who goes first? It's a race. Who's going to do it first? Either him or her. One of them is doing something at some point. 
Somebody gets sick, all of a sudden he doesn't love her anymore. What do you mean you don't love her anymore? Just because she got sick? No, you didn't love her before. Oh, he lost his money? Oh, she wants to leave. I hated you the whole time. What do you mean you hated me the whole time? You liked me when I had money. No, no, really, I hated you. Breakups don't just happen because of crisis. They broke up before, but they tolerated the relationship because of certain conveniences that happened. Immodesty is one of the fuels to the fire. We're almost done with this section, and then I'll tell you some other things that we haven't covered. Now, one of the Gdolim that spoke about wasting seed was Rabbi Aaron Rata. I love a Shalom. Rabbi Aaron, Rabbi Aaron Rata said that a woman who causes men to sin because she decided to put a picture on the internet and she wants to make sure that everybody knows exactly the shape of her lips because she puckered them. She wants to look cute because she saw a movie star do it. She wants to feel like she's in Hollywood. She's hoping that Hollywood catches her image on Facebook. And maybe they call it, wait, we saw your picture? You're hired. You're hired because we saw your picture go like that. So we, you're hired. We're going to put you on Blockbuster movie, $50 million because you puckered your lips. Every woman, she takes pictures, put it on the internet. She wants to make sure everybody knows. She can pucker her lips. She looks cute. She puts the most immodest outfit on the world. Everything. A woman doesn't realize what kind of damage she's bringing herself by doing such a thing. Any smart woman would never put any picture on the internet. And if it's for the sake of shiduch, no more than a headshot. Let's say you want to send it for a shiduch, for a shiduch because in this generation, unfortunately, we have to have shiduch resumes. Shouldn't be more than a headshot. Just your face. They want to see the rest, they should meet you. Unless there's a special shatchan and so on and so forth, people that know what they're talking about, and there's certain things that you could talk to your rabbi about where if they want, let's say, a full profile because they're really, really picky or something like that. But in reality, in reality, Rabotai, on social media, exchanging on text messages, on WhatsApp, any smart woman would never, ever put her picture out there. I have one student that told me I want, I got a job and they told me I want to take a picture. They want to take a picture to put on the website. She said, I don't want a picture. She goes, yeah, but we have to have a website. You have to know who they're talking to. She says, I won't take the job then. Okay, okay, no picture, no picture. Don't look at a gray screen. They look at a gray screen. It's fine. Why? It's better they look at a gray screen, screen than looking at a woman, Hashem Yachem, what they do. Women don't understand how sick the mind of men is. They do, honestly don't understand. They don't understand how sick men are. We're sick. Unless we have Torah. Women don't see it that way. Why? Because they think we think like them. I've said this a thousand times and still people are surprised. A woman looks at a man, she thinks about his character traits. Oh, he looks funny. Oh, he looks generous. Oh, he looks sweet. Oh, he looks like a nice guy. That's what she thinks about. She's not thinking, wow, look at his pecs. Wow, his bicep, it's at least 35 inches. That's a nice hug from a guy like that. No one thinks like that. No one thinks like that. Even the sickest woman in the world doesn't think like that. Why? It's not in their nature to think like that. They look at a guy, they think personality. He looks funny, he looks this, he looks that. That's the way that, that's it. A guy looks at a woman, it could be his cousin, it could be his sister. Does it make a difference who it is? If she's old enough and he's sick enough, he can think, oh, what? Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah and his own mother. If he doesn't have Torah, he can think Sodom and Gomorrah and his own mother. No exaggeration. And people think, no, but he's my best friend. 
best friend, yeah, in a different movie, different world maybe, different Gilgul. The dog is closer of a friend to you than he is. Reality is, Rabotai, women need to wake up. There's no such thing as platonic relationships. Girls being friends with guys. There's nothing platonic about it. No, but he has a girlfriend. He has a wife with three kids. Yes, and as soon as he gets the opportunity, if you give him the opening, he forgets them. Rabbi Aaron Rata says, a woman who causes men to sin because of her immodesty, immodest behavior, immodest dress, immodest laugh, immodest picture, anything, will not be released from Gehenom until all that she created, meaning all the demons that she created from his wasting seed, are destroyed from the world. Yeah, but he's the one that did it. Why is it my fault? Because you caused it. You're partner to the crime. If the mob boss sends his criminals to go kill people, who gets arrested? Everyone. It's not just the guy that killed. It's the guy that sent them to. And the guy that came up with the idea. And the driver. And the guy that... Uh, that uh, all the people involved get arrested. But here, according to the Torah... The woman is just as guilty as the guy. No difference. And until that is destroyed from the world, until they all do tshuva, she is in a very, very bad shape in Shemaim. What about if I did tshuva already, but I made sins in the past? Well, you have to start doing kiruv to make sure that you destroy all of those sins. You have to get other people to do tshuva. Because you don't know who looked at you. You don't know who sinned because of you. You have to start getting people to do tshuva on a regular basis because God only knows how many people sinned because of you. David HaMelech says there's a very big secret of how to do tshuva. Very big secret of how to stop. Chapter 34 of Psalms, verse 14. Lechu banim shimu li irat Adonai elam etchem. Go, O sons, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of Hashem. David the Melech could have chosen any subject in the world to tell you that he could teach you. He knew all of it. He had Ruach HaKodesh. He spoke to Hashem. He could have told you, Go, my sons. I'll teach you algebra. Go, my sons. I'll teach you how to fly rockets. Go, my sons. I'll teach you about banks. I'll teach you about the stock market. He didn't say that. I'll teach you Kabbalah. He didn't say that either. What did he say? I'll teach you fearing of God. That's the secret. You fear the punishment, you start tshuva. You don't fear the punishment, everything you're doing hasn't even begun. If that's not enough, there's a pasuk in the Torah in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Verse 13, 613, like the mitzvot. Moshe Rabbeinu tells Am Yisrael clearly, so there's no confusion. It's a pasuk in the Torah. It's not Yaron Ruven like people think. Oh, you only talk about Yirat Shamayim, fear, fear, fear. No, so now you don't have complaints against me. Go to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, it's section A in Gan Eden. Go over there, but Hashem will give you an answer. Right next to Kisei Kavod, you'll see on the right side, Moshe Rabbeinu. What do he say? Why does Hashem, what does Hashem your God ask of you but simply to fear Him? In so many words, Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us what's the purpose of you? What's the purpose of your life? What does Hashem even need you for? Why are you in the world? Just to fear Hashem. That's it. Yeah, what about loving Hashem? Yeah, love Him too, eventually. But first fear Him. Because without fearing Him, everything else is meaningless. This is one of the most difficult things for people to understand in this generation. For some reason, fearing Hashem has become a curse. Fearing Hashem has become like a bad word, like a bad thing to do. And without it, Rabotai Karim, without fearing Hashem, we have nothing.
Now, there's a few books that anyone that wants to go into more details can look into. Tarat HaKodesh by Rabbi Aaron Rata. Karnot Tzadik by Rabbi Eliyahu Mani. He's one of the giants of uh, Iraq. And Zav Tadkila. These are three major books that have been written about the issues of wasting seed, immodesty, and the like. They talk about things that are much, much harsher than what I told you. What I just said to you for the last hour is like kindergarten. Next to what you're going to find in these books. If that much. They talk to you about how they're going to put you in Gehenom if you don't do tshuva for, for wasting seed. And they're going to start with the hole that you wasted. And then they're going to rip it apart into 50 million pieces. And make sure that you remember this was not what you were supposed to do. And then the woman that liked to expose herself because she wanted to make sure that everybody knows she's around. They're going to hang her by her sex organs on the wall as display. Like my client used to hang animals. These are the types of things that Sadiqim, Kodesh Kodeshim, wrote. If you, you could see more, much more of it if you'd like. We're not going to go into it because we've already done a show about Genom. I'm going to give you some other things. How to fix this problem. Rabbi Eliyahu Mani, who writes a lot of things that are mamash a tragedy to even read. If you don't cry, that means you're probably not alive. Some of the things that he writes about what happens to people who don't do tshuva. He writes that a person that wastes seed, a person that's not careful, in uh, Perek 1, the first Perek, part 7, whoever is not careful with the issue of wasting seed, meaning even if it is accidental, not just intentional, intentional barul, intentional of course, meaning he doesn't watch his eyes, he looks at anything that moves, which of course is going to lead to him to having dreams and he's going to end up wasting seed. He eats certain foods right before he goes to sleep. He's not even care, doesn't care about what to eat, what he does, what he watches. Doesn't care. He just thinks, no, no, I just don't do it on purpose and I'm fine, right? He says he's not careful. Of course he's going to lose all of his money. And if he does it on purpose, Rabbi Karim, Rabbi Eliyahu, Mani Hashem Yirachem, says to us, all of the curses in the Torah, in Parashat Bechukotai, come upon him. Why? Because if you see in the Torah, in Parashat Bechukotai, it talks about Reshaim who don't do tshuva. It talks about people that treat Hashem with casualness. What's casualness? Ve'alachtem imi bekeri. What's keri? Rabbi Eliyahu Mani says, it's also in regards to wasting seed. But this one is not even if he does it on purpose. It's even accidental. All of the curses of the Torah come upon him. Hashem Yerachim. Why? Why weren't you careful? Why don't you read about it? Why don't you work on it? Why are you so careless? You don't realize it's a big deal. It's seed. It's neshamot coming to the world. He says a person that people know he does it, they put him on nidui. Meaning, you, minyan, you can't count them. Everybody knows this guy weighs seed. This guy's promiscuous. Technically, you're not allowed to count them in minyan. This probably kills most of the minyanim in the world. Anytime you see a tzaddik die, say, oh, why did Hashem do this? It's because of people wasting seed, Rabbi Eliyahu Mani says. Rabbi Eliyahu Mani on 118 says that... Uh, what the number one cause of death of the tzaddikim is people that waste seed. People that waste seed create demons that look like dogs and pigs. And these dogs and pigs come to hurt them. One of the sources that you can see it is in the Gemara Masechet Shabbat 151b. Rami, Rami Bar Abba says, a wild beast does not gain power or ascendancy over a man unless the man appears to it like an animal. Meaning, Hashem created the animal in such a way that it has, he told Noah, that the animal is going to be afraid of him. Typically, the dog is supposed to be afraid of a human being. 
The lion is supposed to be afraid of the human being. The cat, the dog, the rhino, all of these animals are supposed to be afraid of human beings. But when are they not afraid? They're not afraid when that man has ruined, has damaged his neshama as a result of wasting seed and now looks to the animal like an animal. Not visually looks like an animal. The lion doesn't think you're a lion. But the neshama, the aura that's being projected from that person no longer scares the lion, no longer scares the dog, no longer scares the cat, the alligator, the so on and so forth. This is why Rabbi uh, Amar Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Hanina, right after it says, "Asul lishon bebet yechidi, v'kol ha'yeshem bebet yechidi, achazato lilit." Rabbi Hanina says it's forbidden to sleep alone in a house. For whoever sleeps alone in the house will be seized by lilit. Who's lilit? The wife of the Satan himself. That's responsible. Of waste helping every man make the crime of wasting seed even when he doesn't want to. Why does he come? Because this person has already made enough sins to make himself look like an animal in the eyes of Hashem. So he's careless about everything, he careless about how he sleeps, he careless about what position, he careless about all the things we're gonna go over in a few minutes. As it says, Abali Potrimlo. Somebody comes to become purified, he does all the actions to do sins, they help him in Shamaim. You don't watch your eyes, we'll bring you the girl to look at. You want to steal, we'll give you an open door to steal. You want to do all types of crimes, Hashem will help you do crimes. You want to do mitzvot, Hashem will help you that too. In 120 says, even a person that weighs seed, even if he's born with a fortune of good mazal. Certain people are born into the world where they're supposed to be rich. They're supposed to be good looking. They're supposed to be something good in the world. Rabbi al says, even if he's born with a good fortune, all will be turned until he becomes poor and loses on all the things that he does to the extent that even the place he lives will start rejecting him as in the land will vomit him meaning a person lives in somewhere in I don't know, the world he lives doesn't have to be Eretz Israel. Let's say he lives in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, he makes crimes with every woman that looks at him, every woman that pays him attention. Sometimes without a woman, sometimes he's by himself, sometimes he's with somebody, who, whatever it is. Eventually, this person was supposed to be somebody special in Am Israel. Such a person can get to a point where everything he does in Los Angeles will fail. Meaning, not only he will lose money, not only is he not going to be able to have kids, not only could he have sickness, but literally anything he does while he lives in that place will fail miserably permanently. Why? Because even the land itself becomes disgusted from him and all the sins that he made, that it vomits him. Doesn't want him there. New York doesn't want him there. Los Angeles doesn't want him there. Ohio doesn't want him there. He can't go anywhere. Why? Everywhere he goes, he makes sins. He doesn't know why everybody hates him. In chapter 2, he starts talking about how to fix all of this. How to fix all of this. And these are the things that each one of you should probably take notes and write down. And if you don't have a pen, then I don't know what shuls you were listening to. In the last few shulim, I've told you to bring some. But you should write this down and go over this like as if it's you're reading... The Torah itself, because these are the things you have to do. If you don't do them, if you don't, if you skip one, you skip two, you skip three, before you know it, you're going to forget to do it, and it's not going to become second nature. 
First and foremost, the person needs to watch his eyes. This is a given. This is something we all know about. We're going to go into details in a moment. But he has to watch his eyes to the extent that he's not even allowed to see animals doing what they do. Some of these uh, discovery channels, nature channels, and so on, they show the public how animals breed. A person that watches his eyes is not even allowed to see that. Needless to say, he's not allowed to see humans do that. He's not allowed to see anything resembling that, even a cartoon. He also has to watch his mouth. If you curse, you will waste seed. Use the F word, the S word, and every other word that sounds like it or is like it and is a cuss word, you will end up wasting seed, either on purpose or accidental or both. Why? Filth create filth. Something impure creates impurity. If your mouth is like a truck driver going, then you will end up wasting seed. You have to speak appropriately. Trust me, I know it's not, uh, not uh, easy. I came from New York. Cursing was our second language. But if you want to do serious tshuva, this is a must. Next thing is, we'll surprise most people, but we've already done a whole Mishnah about it. Don't speak to the woman. The Mishnah says, who is this woman? His own wife. Don't speak to her too much. Meaning, speak just enough to do what you need to do, to maintain the relationship, to pay attention to her. But don't become our second girlfriend, where you're sitting uh, three, four hours talking about uh, the weather and uh, the neighbors and everything else. Talk about the kids, talk about uh, whatever it is that you need to talk about, but don't become best friends with your wife to the extent where you just you guys hang out for three, four hours just talking nonsense because you have nothing else to do, as if you know the entire shots by heart. Talk when it's necessary. Talk when it has a meaning. Even when it comes to your wife, needless to say, don't talk to strangers. If it's a strange woman, unless she's your manager, your customer, your boss, you have absolutely no reason to talk to her. I can tell you myself, Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Ephraim and I have spoken, I don't know how many hours. I think that in all the years that we've talked, in all the time that we've spent in his own house, I spent a, I don't know, a few months in his house. I lived with him for a few months, a few times. Every time I go to Israel, I stay at his house for a month, two months, however long I'm there, I stay at his house. Throughout all that time, I'm inside his house. Throughout all of the years, we talk on Skype, every day almost, Baruch Hashem. For years. I could probably count the amount of words that I've heard his wife say directly to me on two hands. Meaning, literally, I don't think she's ever said ten words to me, directly. Same thing, vice versa. Now she'll tell him, I'm right, she's right there, I'm right here, and he's right there. She'll tell him to tell me. I'll tell him to tell her. Why? She's his wife, not mine. Same thing with my wife. He has never spoken to my wife, not even ten words. He has never spoken to my wife directly, ever. Ever, like never, ever, ever. Not once, not twice, not seven, never. Now, he's the one that Baruch Hashem helped us convert. I mean, he had to teach us. He would teach me, you tell her. And it's not because of the language barrier, trust me. It's because that's the way it is. There's no such thing as a, oh no, she's my uh, friend's wife, so we talk. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. People have their friends' friends come over and, oh, is Joe here? Oh, he's not here. Okay, I'll have coffee with you. Guys come over their friend's house when they're not even there. It's Asul. It's a Yichud. You have to be so careful. You have to be so careful. If you treated your wife like she's a priceless diamond, this wouldn't happen. But people treat like their wife like she's some rat they want outside. Of course, she's going to go outside. No, honey, call, call my friend for me. Let me ask him what he's doing this weekend. They make their wife their secretary to call their guy friends. And then they're surprised. She doesn't want to be with him. She wants to be with his friend. 
or vice versa. He starts calling her girlfriends. Oh, yeah, um, uh, Martha and uh, Samantha said that they're not coming this weekend. What do you think? I don't know. Ask him what they're doing next weekend. So he calls them back. Hey, so what are you doing? And he starts chit-chatting, becoming friends with them. Hey, who'd you talk to? Oh, no, I just talked to Martha. You talked to my friend Martha? Why are you talking to my friend Martha? No, nah, I'm just checking on her. She, I felt bad because last time I spoke to her yesterday, she sounded depressed. I was checking on her. Why are you checking on my girlfriend? Why do you care she sounded depressed? In the secular world, everything I'm saying to you sounds strange. But that's why their divorce rate is 80 to 90%. In the Orthodox Jewish world, there's no such thing as girlfriends for a guy. I'm telling you with my own rabbi, we talk Baruch Hashem every day. It's, it's an amazing thing. His wife is right next to him. I don't see her. She's out of the screen. My wife's right next to me sometimes. She doesn't see her. She's out of the screen. Why? Why are they going to be on the screen for? For what? But she wants to say something. Say it to me. And I'll say it to him. Say it to him. And he'll say it to me. They want to talk to each other. Oh, Chabad, we talk to each other. We leave. Why? It's not our business what they want to talk about. There's a certain code. There's a certain level of respect. There's a certain level of how you treat your wife. It's supposed to be a treasure. It's not closing her in or suffocating her or anything like that, like some stupid people think. It's You have to realize, if she's your wife, that means you, at some point thought that she was the most valuable thing on earth that you cannot live without her if you didn't then i don't know why you married her if you think you can live without her then you should have married somebody else that's the point of marrying somebody because you come to terms that you can't live without her you want to replicate her she wants to replicate you that's the point of marriage the reality is people treat their wives and their husbands like it's toys no i don't want to play with it anymore Old news. You play with it. You, you go. You play with it for a week or two. Let me know why you like it. Maybe you keep it. Give me your toy. It's very important to treat our spouses with a certain amount of respect, a certain amount of protection, because that is what preserves our relationships, Rabotai. Further, he says that a guy shouldn't even be get to a point of even touching women or their clothing. All of these men that are in the clothing business, if it's women's clothing, they should probably find a different profession. Find something else to sell. There's plenty of other things to sell. Why? Because unless you can find somebody to touch it, unless you can find somebody to look at it, and you can focus just on numbers, you're going to end up sinning. All of these guys that do the uh, hair for women, there's no way for them to avoid genom. All of these guys that uh, sell clothing to women directly, men selling to women, there's no way for them to avoid genom. No way. It's impossible. Why? You look at women's clothes, you think about women. You think about women, you think about what they look at without the clothes. That's the way we were created, Rabotai. You can't defy nature. This is the way we all are. You can't, you cannot change it. Only way to change it is just not be there. That's not changing it. That's just simply avoiding it. Further, don't waste your time being sad. Some people like to want, you know, a lot of Israelis, including myself, I used to like listening to sad songs. Shiret Dikaon. There's an actual uh, genre of songs in Israel called depressing songs. It's like the kind of songs that by the time he's like in the middle of the song, you want to take your heart and just throw it in the garbage. It's like, oh, I can't believe it. Why'd she do it? Why'd he do it? You want to cry during a song. I like, a lot of Israelis like it. I don't know why. We were much like uh, crazy people. But that's the way it is. We like it. Don't do it. Why? Sadness leads to wasting seed. Sadness leads to wasting seed. Sadness leads to promiscuity. Sadness leads to a lot of problems. In fact, there's a whole pasuk in the Torah in Parashat Kitavo. 
Hashem says to Am Yisrael, why are you getting this punishment? Because you did not fulfill my mitzvot from happiness. In Parashat Kitavot, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47, Tachat et Hashem Elokecha besimcha ubitov levav berav kol ve'avadta et avicha asher yishlechenu Hashem et oivecha asher yishlechenu Hashem So Hashem is saying, because you didn't serve Hashem, your God, with happiness and a good heart, you're going to end up serving your enemy. Meaning, a person that's sad on a regular basis, depressed about his life, because he didn't get to where he wants to be, she didn't get to where she wants to be, her zivug left her, his zivug left him, all of these things that make people sad, get over it. Why? You don't. You're letting the Yetzirah park in your house. And the Yetzirah, he's not looking for you to make small sins. He's looking for you to start with small sins. And then he takes over the entire account. Entire account meaning he's going to let, lead you to promiscuity. He's going to lead you to wasting seed. He's going to lead you to the worst possible things that will disconnect you from Hashem completely. Listening to unholy music, unholy things, any type of secular music, non-kosher music, non-Torah music is going to lead a person to wasting seed. People that like to listen to rap full of curses, people that like to listen to hip-hop full of curses, people that like to listen to these types of songs that talk about arrogance, money, promiscuity, all types of garbage. It's not just bad for your time, it's bad for your neshama. It's bad for your neshama. You listen to it, you're going to think it. You're going to think it, you're going to do it. That's why the Rambam Posek, he says, Iwe Avera are worse than Avera. Thinking about the Avera is even worse than the Avera itself. Why is thinking about the Avera worse than the Avera itself? Thinking about sin is worse than the sin itself. In... Um, Guide for the Perplexed, Moray Nebuchim, he says because when you do an Avera, you do an Avera, it's everybody sees. People see, God sees. But when you think of an Avera, only Hashem sees. Meaning, when you make an Avera, you don't care about anybody. You don't care what anybody thinks. Not God, not people. But when you think about Avera, you think about sins, that means that Dafka, you're going against Hashem only. Makes it much worse. Why? Hashem says, okay, he doesn't care about anybody. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about his wife. She doesn't care about her husband. She doesn't care about her kids. She doesn't care about anything. But when you think about the sin, only Hashem knows what you're thinking. Hashem says, so I'm the only one you don't care about. Everybody else you're worried about. You're worried about what she says about you. You're worried about what he says about you. You're worried about what the dog says about you. You're not going to make the sin in front of the dog. But you make the sin in front of me. This is what the Rambam says makes thinking about sin even worse than the sin itself. Also, when you go to sleep, make sure you don't have clothing or shoes around your bed. This is predominantly a, a problem for guys, especially guys that are single, that don't know how to clean up after themselves because they think that some magical fairy is going to come and clean for them and they leave their clothes on the floor because the magical fairy is somehow gonna appear well news if magical doesn't fairy doesn't come the next day it's never coming pick up your stuff don't have clothing and shoes around your bed why Rabbi Eliyahu Mani says this also leads to wasting seed at night also spider webs above the bed don't ask me why these make sense. I'm not at the level to know why this stuff makes sense. All I know is how to read. I know how to read and I can speak. That's the two things I know. As far as how, who, what, when, and how, that's not my business. All I know is how to tell you. Spider webs above the bed, he says it leads to wasting seed. But also another Chacham says that it also leads to Shlom bite problems. Even if you don't have arachnophobia. Doesn't make a difference. You have uh, spider webs, clean it. It's really high, get a chair. Too high, get a ladder. Also, people that don't wash their hands in the morning, that don't do netilat yadayim, they're not careful with netilat yadayim, 
they should know that when you go to sleep, it's one sixtieth of death. It's one sixtieth of death, and when you wake up in the morning, there's a special malach that's still on there. That malach is the daughter of the Satan. You're not even allowed to touch your ears. You're not allowed to touch your nose. You're not allowed to touch your genitals. You're not allowed to touch your mouth. The Gemara says it's better off you cut off his hand than him touching himself, any part of his body, before he washes his hand with Netilat Yadayim. So a person that's not careful with Netilat Yadayim, either before he eats food, or after he uh, he wakes up in the morning, or even after going to the bathroom. After the bathroom is no bracha, but still for the sake of cleanliness, should always be conscious of the fact that you have to wash your hands on a regular basis. Every single time you enter the bathroom, Rav Bar Kochba, the one that uh, wrote the, uh, rewrite, rewrote the, republished the book of Rav Mizrahi, the, the Rav of the Chida, he has a whole shio on the internet about the importance of Netilat Yadayim. And he says that even if you walk into a bathroom that's filthy, like a public bathroom, and you don't go to the bathroom, you still should wash your hands. Meaning you don't go to the bathroom. You're just going there to look at yourself in the mirror because you want to make sure that your hair is over here and your hair is over here and you want to make sure that in case Hollywood shows up, you look good. You did that? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. For the sake of cleanliness is spirituality, not uh, physicality. You didn't touch anything. Spirituality. We, because if a place is tamed, that's filthy, has bad smell, there's also bad other things there. Now some people's bathrooms are uh, better than Taj Mahal. Some people's bathrooms are fancy, schmancy, and there's no problem of going into the bathroom. You don't need to wash your hands. In fact, some people's bathrooms, Ravi again, Allah Shalom said, that some people's bathrooms look much better than their Olam Abba. They invest a half a million dollars into their bathroom, but their Olam Abba is like a homeless shelter. So we should at least invest just as much money into Olam Abba. Next is sleeping too much. You sleep too much, you are guaranteed to waste seed. This pretty much affects every single guy that still hasn't grown up or every single youngster that likes to sleep on the weekends until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You're always going to wake up with a surprise. And it's not going to be a surprise. Why? Sleeping too much leads to wasting seed, especially sleeping deep. This, by the way, is one of the reasons, one of the secrets of why the Chachamim don't sleep much. You see in the entire Gemara, you see David HaMelech never slept more than 15 minutes. The Arizal, the Arizal HaKadosh never slept more than two hours. And he would do it only in half hour increments. He would sleep two hours a day, but only in half hour increments. I'm not suggesting anybody sleep two hours a day because we can't do it in our generation. But their fear of wasting seed was to an extent where they were too scared to go to sleep. It's not that they weren't tired. They're more tired than you right now that you have to sleep in my shoe. They're more tired than you, but they didn't go to sleep. Why? They were scared of wasting seed. Even though they learned Torah all day, learned 25 hours. Still scared. Sleeping too much, needless to say, somebody sleeps 8, 9, 10 hours a day. You're not being careful with your breath. You're going to end up wasting seed. You're sleeping too much. Sleeping late, missing Kriyat Shema, guaranteed to waste seed. Accidental, on purpose, both, sometimes this, sometimes that. Every day it's a salad. Sometimes you do both because you want to be machmir in Geinom, whatever it is. Sometimes you want to make sure to make sure you get VIP in Geinom. So you do both. You figured you messed up in the morning, let's mess up at night also. That's what the Yetzirah tells us. Sometimes you mess up in the morning, you make one sin. He wants says, yeah, you made one sin, just destroy the whole city. Yeah, you stole one peanut. Just rob the bank now. One sin is one sin enough. Do tshuva. But the Yetzirah will make you think that you made one sin. Might as well destroy the whole place. Also, it's treating mitzvot lightly. He says, if you start treating mitzvot lightly, you're going to waste seed. Why? Because your mind is not clean. And at night, it's not going to be strong enough that when the Satan's wife shows up, you're not going to be able to beat her. A weak mind has an impossible chance of overcoming these dreams. Impossible chance of having a safe night's sleep when it comes to wasting seed. Or anybody that disrespects the sages. 
you start saying, nah, Rashi, eh, I don't think I don't think Rashi was right on this one. Rambam, nah, I'm not really sure. Not really sure. I'm gonna finish the point. I'll answer your question at the end. You don't have to raise your hand. I, I saw it five times. You treat the sages lightly, no good. Or somebody that likes to play with his hair. You ever see these guys play with their hair? You know, they, they put the gel in their hair and they do their hair five hundred times a day. You know, the moment they, in case Hollywood shows up, no good. Why? Apparently, it's going to lead to wasting seed. You're too comfortable with your body. But worse than anything else, everything I read to you until now, there's one thing that's worse than everything. Gava. Someone that's arrogant. A person that's arrogant is guaranteed to waste seed. Not only accidental, but also on purpose. Why? Because the root of wasting seed is gava. To such an extent that Rabbi Nachman Mibreslav says, the people that are gaftanim, the people that are arrogant, end up wasting seed. If they don't have that under control, they're going to become very promiscuous. If they don't have that under control, they're going to become homosexuals too. Once a person does not control his arrogance, and starts thinking that everything belongs to them, their body belongs to them, somebody else's body belongs to them, and doesn't control himself, has excuses for everything, she has excuses for everything, eventually their natural state is not going to be so natural. You have a problem, you can call Rabbi Nachman Breslev, he's in Gan Eden right now, Baruch Hashem, go see, maybe he'll answer your call. Now, how do you fix all this stuff? It's probably about 60 different things maybe more, 70 different things that a person needs to do to fix. This is just briefly from these three books. We're not going to go into detail with everything. We're going to go into detail with only a couple of them. But these are things that even if you do one of them, two of them, half of them, ten of them, whatever it is, it's good. Everything you can do is good. Just the more you do, the better. First, Taniyot, the different fasts. Different fasts that a person can add to their life. If you're a strong personality, you're able to fast. I don't mean fast and sleep all day. Fast and study Torah all day. Fast and operate, function. If you're like half dead when you're fasting, don't fast at all. No one needs your fast. The fasts that the tzaddikim do are not fast that you go to sleep and you wait for it to be over. Fasting is for the sake of exerting yourself even more. If you can't do it, don't fast at all. Quite frankly, my own Rav told me fasting is almost for nobody in his generation. Almost no one in his generation can fast. Even on Yom Kippur, when everybody knows it's Isur Karet, almost everybody fails. Everybody can't wait to have the coffee, but it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Everyone thinks about it. Everybody has a problem with it. Everybody is thinking about, I can't wait till it's over. They look at the clock the whole time. So to fast electively, when it's not Isul Karet, it's almost not an issue for people. Meaning it's 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 not relevant to people. So if you can fast, come, you come to me or go to your Rav that knows about Taniyot and you can designate specific times that you can fast. Some people do it Mondays and Thursdays. Some people do it Fridays. You have to know who, what, when, and how, but that's, again, assuming that you could study Torah the whole day. Not that you sleep all day. Quite frankly, I don't recommend it because I think that most people can't do it. And realistically, there's so many other things to do that are so difficult that this, I think, puts it over the top. Some of the other things you can do is vidui. When you do vidui, when you do chatanu, avinu, pashanu during your tefillah, Learn the meaning of the words. If you're not an expert in Hebrew, learn the meaning of the words in English. What does it mean? Think about what you did that's relevant to this sin. When it says chatanu, what does chatanu mean? Oh, it means an accidental sin. I didn't mean to. Why did I mean to? Because I didn't learn Torah. Oh, I'm sorry, Hashem. I didn't, I didn't learn Torah. That's why I sinned. Avinu. Avinu means I did the sin on purpose because I have desires. Not because I hate you, Hashem. I love you, but I have desires. I'm sorry, Hashem, for acting like an animal. Animals have desires. I have desires. Animal doesn't control itself. I don't control myself. No good. 
I'm sorry, Hashem. Pashanu. Hashem, not only I made a sin, I did a dafka to make you mad. I'm sorry, Hashem, for being a moron. I'm sorry for making such a stupid sin, thinking that I could sin against you on purpose and nothing's going to happen. You need to know what it says. Pashanu, Avinu, and so on and so forth. You look at the Vidu and you actually understand what it says, pretty much we're criminals in almost every aspect of it. Learn what it says, do it. Do it in a fashion where you're not like some of these people that are like Speedy Gonzalez, like the cartoons, like, ah, ah, like oh, everybody's Sadiqim, they don't have to worry about any sins. Think about what you did and say, I'm sorry. Why? Because sorry is Chuba. Sorry is the beginning of Chuba. If Adam Arishon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, in the Zohar Kadosh, if Adam Arishon, Adam Arishon, would have said, I'm sorry to Hashem, instead of blaming his wife, he would have stayed in Gan Eden forever. He would have stayed in Gan Eden. That's it. The rest of the world wouldn't have been created. He would just stay in Gan Eden. Just saying, I'm sorry. The magnitude of saying, I'm sorry. Read Tehilim. Read Tehilim regularly. Women should read Tehilim regularly like it's as if there's nothing else exists. You should never waste a single minute reading newspapers. Don't waste your time reading the news. It's always the same thing. Somebody died, somebody uh, you know, is born, somebody suing someone. It's the same news every day. Read Tehilim. Tehilim is going to help you. Guys should read Tehilim on a regular basis. You want to read Tikkun HaKlali like Rabbi Nachman Breslev. You want to just read the entire book. But you know, if you can't do the whole thing, do 5, 10, 15 a day until you finish the whole book. There's specific Tehilim that are meant for specific issues, I personally recommend reading the whole thing. Meaning, if you can't read it all in one sitting, then read as much as you can every day. Let's say you can do 10 a day, read from 1 to 10. The next day, 11 to 20. Next day, 21 to 30. Until you finish the whole book, then start all over again. Start all over again. This is, will get you also not only to be comfortable with Tehilim, but also will help you with Tefillah, because many, much of our Tefillah is from Tehilim. A woman that doesn't work, and doesn't have children, should read the entire book of Tehilim every day. Also, there's a zgula that's bduka, that's, that's confirmed. Someone that needs a miracle desperately should read the entire book of Tehilim 40 days in a row. I know this works. I've seen it happen several times. This is not, not one of those magic tricks. It's not easy either. To read the entire book of Tehilim takes a while. But... If you're already familiar with Tehilim and you have the ability, you should push yourself, read the entire book every day for 40 days straight. And throughout the entire time, ask Hashem. Plead for Hashem for what you want, what it is. Obviously Hashem knows, but the point is, without skipping. Like some people tell me, what if I do it for seven days, but then I skip and I come back the next day. Is that okay? No, it's not okay. It's okay that you're reading it, but it doesn't count towards the 40 days. It's good that you're reading it. It just doesn't count towards the 40 days. It has to be 40 days straight. Hence the point. It's difficult, but 40 is symbolic for renewal. Next is work on humility. This is the biggest thing of all. A person needs to realize that everything they have is only from Hashem. Nothing is from you. Rabbi again, Allah Shalom used to say, if you want to be somebody, realize that you're a nobody. If you think you're somebody, then you're definitely a nobody. We're not talking about being self-conscious and thinking of yourself as a loser. That's not what we're talking about. We're thinking about anything that you're doing good, always give credit to Hashem. Anything you have, give credit to Hashem. Everything that you do that's successful, everything is Hashem. Failures are us, success is His. Don't look for compliments. Don't ask for people, hey, you like what I did over there? You see this building I built? You see this video I made? You see this money I made? You see this stock I picked? You see this wife I picked? You see this husband? Don't ask for people's uh, approval. Why? It's a sign of arrogance. It's not good. Next, never embarrass anyone, including yourself. There's no mitzvah in embarrassing yourself. In fact, these are the items that the Chachamim are saying that will fix your breath. Each one of them fixes your breath a little bit more. If you, if you are normally, you like to embarrass people, you like to make fun of them, or you like to make fun of yourself, or you like to abuse yourself, you stop, this helps you fix your breath. Each one of them takes another facet of it, another aspect of it, another part of it. 
be very careful and very makpid with netilat yadayim, like we said. Feed poor people. Any opportunity you have to feed poor people, take it. Don't be wasteful with food. Don't be wasteful with food. Wasting your food is like wasting seed. Each one of these has a much more debt than what I'm telling you, but it's going to take five hours to explain each one. So I'm just giving you the basic bullet point. Don't be wasteful with food because being wasteful with food is symbolic of wasting seed. Seed is the shefa that Hashem gives you. Food is the shefa that Hashem gives you. The sustenance that Hashem gives you. Spiritual sustenance, physical sustenance. You waste food, you're going to end up wasting seed. You're not wasteful with food, you're not going to be wasteful with seed. Also, make sure to eat the remains of the motzi. Sometimes you have like a little two, three, four, five pieces of motzi on Shabbat. Eat it. Don't throw it in the garbage. This also helps with the fixing the tikkun abrit. When it comes to birkat amazon, when birkat amazon comes, make it as if it's the only thing that exists in the world. If you have full kavanah during birkat amazon, it's a major tikkun for brit. Major tikkun. Like you have to act like Brikat Amazon is the only thing that exists. Do it out loud. Try to even do it as a song if you want. Enjoy it. Connect to it. Don't be one of these people that breezes through it because you can't wait to get to something else. There's nothing more important than Brikat Amazon. It's more important than Shema Yisrael. And it also helps fix the Brit. Next he says, this is actually from Abiyahon Atta, this next list. No speaking in shul. You speak in shul, you're going to end up wasting seed at some point. Why? Because you're being careless about the mitzvot of the sages as well as the Torah. When it comes to Kriyat Shema, you do Kriyat Shema, break Kriyat Shema into a few. Shema, Israel, Hashem, Elokeinu, Hashem, Echad, or Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, and extend the word Echad, the D, extend it. Break it up. Why? Because it'll help you think about it. What does each word mean? And have more kavanah. Realize that Hashem is in front of you. This also helps fix the brit. Uh, there's also a special prayer that many sidurim have. Many of the sidurim have a added prayer during, uh, during Amidah, I believe, that talks about all the seed that a person wasted. Hashem, may, may you take this seed and put it in the right place, help me fix it, and so on and so forth. Not all Sidurim have it. I think Amos has one. Okay, so show him that. It's anyone that wants it, Amos will show you. He has it in the Sidu. Um, go to the Mikveh. Obviously, women have to for, for Tarat Mishpacha, but men, you don't have to go to Mikveh, but you should go to the Mikveh if you have a Mikveh that's a kosher Mikveh. What is a kosher Mikveh? A kosher mikveh doesn't mean that it just has the 40 se'ah of the water. A kosher mikveh means that the people in the mikveh are not walking around naked like they're dolphins. If your mikveh is full of penguins, everybody walks around with no clothes, you can't go there. It's not a kosher mikveh. If people know how to be modest, then you can go there. If there's nobody there, then you can go there. But if everybody thinks that they're penguins... Then you cannot go there. It's not a kosher mikveh. It's better you never go to a mikveh once in your life. I can tell you personally, I don't go to a mikveh for, I don't know how, it's a very long time. A few years I haven't gotten one because I can't find one that's kosher. And it makes me sick that people have entire conversations while they're completely naked. Uh, Apparently the issue is not so simple in Israel either. Apparently there's penguins over there also. So if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have a kosher mikveh, Without penguins, then you can go. If you don't, then don't go because it will actually make you make sins. Looking at the genitalia of another person will make you make sins. Read Shara Kedusha in Rishit Chochma. Shara Kedusha, unfortunately, is only, in, as from my knowledge, it's only available in uh, Hebrew. But if you're able to read Hebrew, you should read it. You read Shalak Dusha and Rishit Chochma as often as you can. Why? Once you read it, you're never going to want to even look at your Brit. Because it'll tell you all the things that I just said times a million. And it'll scare your life out that you're not going to want to look at it. You're going to want to be Rabbi Yudah Nasi. That is an entire life he never looked down there. Not he didn't touch it. He never looked. He never looked below his belly. Never looked. That's why they call him Rabbi Kadosh. 
He was so holy, he never looked at his brit. By the way, that's another thing. Don't look at your brit. I know this is difficult because people are used to it and it's their body and they're comfortable with it. You look at it, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help you at all. It's the opposite. Now you're saying, I can't, I can't. In your mind, you're saying, this guy's out of his mind already. He's taking extended. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. It's actually very possible. You can do it. You just have to want to do it. If you're single, if you're single, Gemara says you can only clean yourself with some type of sponge, thick sponge. You're not allowed to touch your member with your own hand. If you're single. If you're married, you're allowed to touch your member with your own hand, but you shouldn't anyway. You're allowed to, but you shouldn't anyway, but only in the specific conditions. In general, you shouldn't touch your member ever. In fact, if you can, don't look at it. This is what you want to teach your kids, but Hashem, you have kids one day, teach them not to look at it. It's the best solution in the world. If they already know from six, seven years old not to look at it, they'll keep their bleat their entire life. But someone who doesn't learn this is going to become very comfortable with it and is going to make their member their best friend and Hashem and Hashem what's going to happen to them. In general, you should avoid touching it with your own hand. In general, if, a, uh, if uh, you have to urinate, then sit down. If you have to clean yourself, use a big sponge or something that's, a, uh, that's going to clean it with. Don't touch it with your own hand. In the beginning, it's a little weird. It's a little uncomfortable, but after a while, not only do you get used to it, but you get used to the fact that you're uncomfortable with yourself, which is a fantastic feeling. It's a fantastic feeling of Kedusha, to not be comfortable with yourself. Why? Because that way you don't waste seat. Crying. Crying is fantastic. Anyone that cries over his sins, it's very good. If you can't cry yet, then Bezad Hashem, hopefully you will be able to after this you when you think about what I said. Doing vidui every day, being a sandak in a brit milah, being a sandak in a brit milah is also a very good idea. It helps uh, fix the brit. Going up to the Torah as an aliyah once a month and reading every word with the Baal Kore, word for word, silently. Obviously, don't interrupt him, but read it word for word with him once a month. Give tzedakah every single day. Give tzedakah every single day to your ability. If you can give $100 a day, give $100 a day. You can give $10 a day, give $10 a day. You give a quarter a day, give a quarter a day, whatever it is. If you're giving a dollar a day or 25 cents a day, don't send it to me, please. Because the fees on the internet, already the minimum fee is like 50 cents. So if you give me a dollar, thank you very much, but we don't get a dollar. So you don't get the whole bitzvah, you get 50 cents. You could save the dollars, put them in a stock box, and you give the whole thing at the end of the month. Online, it's not worth it to send small money, like a dollar. Once you get to 10, 20, 50, 1,000, 50,000, a million, then we'll take it. But dollar, don't send because, I'm serious, because some people send a dollar a day, and I feel bad telling them that, you know, the they, they, uh, payment terminals, uh, I don't know whether it's PayPal or any of the other ones that we use, eat up half the, half the dollar. But you should give tzedakah every single day. The next thing is that helps Gamma Brit. Surprisingly, I know that Amos is going to love this one because he's very, very good at this mitzvah. And Bezad Hashem will continue being very good at this mitzvah. Onik Shabbat. Onik Shabbat is something that we should all be a makpid on. Make sure you're very good. Learn from Amos. I'm not, I'm not making fun. I'm serious. I'll buy you Onik Shabbat like Amos. He doesn't look at the price of what things cost. He just buys because it's Shabbat. He told me he has guests in his house, 20 salads, 20 salads, like having a, at least 20 salads. That's Onik Shabbat. If you like food, you like Onik Shabbat, as long as you continue studying Torah. But if you fall asleep like a donkey, then it's not Onik Shabbat. Then it's a, uh, you just like to eat. Meaning you study Torah, but also you eat and you do all the things that you enjoy. Onik Shabbat. Onik Shabbat mechaper al b'gam abrit. Also lighting many candles for Shabbat. Aside from the two that you light, light other ones. The husband should light some candles if he wants, or the wife could light for him. But the point is, light many candles for Shabbat. It's very good. Giving kavod to people that learn Torah. Chachamim, kavod chachamim. 
you give kavod to the chachamim, support chachamim, is a tikkun from Gama Brit. If you're alone, you're praying alone, you're not going to disturb other people, cry hysterically when you're praying. Fantastic tikkun abrit. Also, learning mishnayot. Some people say learn 18 mishnayot per day. It's a fantastic tikkun abrit during the time of Shovavim, right as we are right now. 18 mishnayot per day. Or as many as possible, obviously. Learning Zohar does not require you to understand what it actually says, but it still has Kedusha in it, even if you just read the words. Read, I don't know, 10 minutes, 5 minutes worth of Zohar. Even if you don't understand it, it's still good for Tikkun Abrit. Um, looking at your Tzitzit, looking at your Tzitzit, and also sleeping with your Tzitzit. Go to sleep with your Tzitzit on. Even though you're not obligated, that's the point. Be the first person in Beknesset. Toil to do mitzvot to the point of sweating. You have a mitzvah, you have to get somewhere, you have to do something. Push yourself hard. Anytime Ami Sred got lazy, Amalek showed up. When we went to the Refidim, Refidim comes from the word Refion. Refion means laziness. Am Yisrael got the Refidim, Amalek showed up the next parasha. Do Kiruv as much as possible. This is the ultimate tikkun for wasting seed in the past and obviously if you ever do in the future. Why? You get other people to do tshuva, you're fixing your prior sins. Become zealous to the fullest extent So your sins are forgiven to the fullest extent. Being zealous, telling people Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat, telling people Gainom is real, it's not a joke, it's not a fairy tale. No share of the world to come doesn't mean emptiness, it it literally means eternal punishment. You're not allowed to steal, you're not allowed to be modest, you're not allowed to talk in shul. Being zealous, but obviously in an appropriate way. Don't uh, you know embarrass people only when you're allowed to embarrass them. Try to start it with the Noah, meaning do it privately, one-on-one. Explain to them once, twice, three times, and so on. But zealousness to the fullest extent. No breaks. Why? You're trying to save Neshamot. You save their Neshamot, Hashem will forgive your sins to the fullest extent. Learn Torah before you go to sleep. Learn Torah at night. Stop lying. Stop saying Lashon Hara. Start your night by sleeping on the left side. Then switch to the right. Sleep with a tzitzit as we said. Some people say put a stone under your pillow. Some people say Kabbalistic uh, uh, psukim. For the sake of Kedusha, don't do it unless you're at that level. Because if you say Psukim from the Kabbalah, you say Psukim from the Torah, that you're not Raui, you're not at that level, you're actually making the Malachim angry and they'll actually get you the waste seed. You're actually having the opposite effect. I'm not going to go into the Kabbalah of it, but the point is, if you're at a high level, say it. You're not, you're an average Joe, don't say these special Psukim, I don't care who told you. Don't remain single. Huh? Which, one Which one of the famous psukim? Yeah. There's many, Bo Hashem. Don't remain single. Get married. Doesn't matter if you have money or not. Your wife doesn't need your money. She needs you. If you think a wife needs your money, then you have no idea what marriage is about. Be a makpid on fourth meal. Suda revit on Motzei Shabbat. This Seuda is anyone that has this Seuda has many, many ma'alot. We learn from David Melech, but also we learn here that it has to do with Tikkun Abrit. Do every mitzvah with happiness to the fullest extent. Don't be one of these people like, ah, okay, fine, I'll come. You do that, better off not to do it. Better off not to do it. If you're one of those, eh, like, like, like you're doing God a favor, don't do it. Even though it says, uh, 
People that do mitzvah like that and they think it's okay, eventually they're not going to do it at all. You have to realize, you have to do, want to do the mitzvah. If you don't want it, get yourself to want it. Push yourself. But at the very least, don't disrespect it. Don't disrespect the mitzvah. Even if you don't want to do it, keep quiet. Keep it to yourself that you don't want to do it. Also, you can say a pasuk saying, Or zaru ala tzaddik. It's a pasuk from the Torah. Or zaru ala tzaddik. Light is, uh, emanates for the tzaddik, for the righteous. Don't give people evil eye. Don't look at other people's money. Don't look at other people's wife. Don't look at other people's husband. Don't look at other people's kids. Don't be an evil eye. Don't be an Ainara. Why? You bring it on yourself that way and leads to a lot of sins, including Gamma Brit. If you have a good eye, it fixes your Brit. Also, learn Tana Deve Liao. Learn Tana Deve Liao, and after you finish learning Tana Deve Liao every day, a little bit every day, say Liao Navi 72 times. When you say amen, don't be one of these people that says half of amen. Like, men, 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 men. Why? Because in Shemaim, I'm going to teach you a little bit of Kabbalah, but uh, in Shemaim, every time you say men, 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 this is called orphaned amen. An orphan amen. It's like an amen without a father. There's no, there's a no aleph in this amen. In Shemaim, those amens will go against you, not for you. So unless you're going to say amen, don't say nothing. Amen, 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 and full kavana. If you just say men, 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 like you sound like a barking dog, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Say amen with full kavana helps with galbrit. It bodedut. It bodedut, but the type of it bodedut where you're alone, but you're only thinking about Hashem. Don't think about all the things you want from Hashem. Think about Hashem. En od milvado. Nothing else but Him. Don't think about Hashem, give me a car, give me this, give me... Don't think about that. It would do just think 5, 10, 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour, however long you can do it. Just think about Yehud Hashem. Think about Hashem. The greatness of Hashem. How amazing is Hashem? It's not a... You're not going for a shopping list. Just think about Hashem. Trust me, you do that, because Hashem, you'll have a lot of success in your life. Listen to rebuke from a Chacham. If you have a chacham in your life and he's willing to rebuke you, look for it, ask for it, ask for it as much as possible. Why? If you do that, it helps a lot with tikkun abrit. Anytime you have isuim, you have any type of suffering, accept it with love. Even though it hurts, it's annoying, it's this, it's that. Say, thank you, Hashem, I know it's good for me. I appreciate it, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Wow, ooh, wow. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Why? You don't know why. Just thank you. Everything is for good. Accept it with love. It helps with Gamabrit. Give people kav schut. Give people uh, the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume the worst on people, even though it's very easy to, and most likely you're right. Still, give them kav schut if they have the right, if they have the, uh, if they're, you're allowed to give them kav schut. Meaning, if the person is known to be righteous, give him kav schut. But if he's known to be Hitler, you're not allowed to give him kav schut. If it's a Mechalel Shabbat, you can't give him kav schut. If you shomer Torah and mitzvot, you have to give him kaf Battery is almost dying in this uh, phone, so Facebook, I'm sorry if it shuts off. Work on bitachon. Work on your bitachon. Test yourself. Uh, Saba Mislavotka used to literally work on his bitachon to show himself that he has bitachon. He would show up to the train with no ticket. He'd sit there. Somebody is sitting next to him and goes, so, oh, for the where are you going? Oh, I'm going to such and such. Oh, you have a ticket? No. Oh, the train's coming in 15 minutes. Yeah, Bezat Hashem. Okay, Bezat Hashem, Bezat Hashem, you have to get a ticket. Yeah, yeah, Bezat Hashem, Bezat Hashem. And he wouldn't get a ticket. And the guy is looking, like, well, you need, you need a ticket. 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 Five, two minutes before the train comes, the guy goes to take a ticket. He goes, next time, don't be so crazy. Nobody else is going to save you like me. He says, next time Hashem is going to send another person like you. Next time Hashem is going to send. Why? He didn't want to get the ticket. It's not about the money. It's about showing that he knows that Hashem will take care of him. To such an extent that one time you actually had one of his tests. He was known to give tests to himself. He said to people, I'm going to go to the Yah. I'm going to go to the woods to go learn Torah. And I know that Hashem is going to keep the light on for me. He went to the Yah. And of course, it gets dark. As soon as it got dark, 
he reached behind him to see if Hashem's giving him something. Some hand reached out with an with a uh, candle, a lit candle. He took the candle. He started talking the whole night. He had this candle for almost twenty years. Light. It never went out. This candle never went out for twenty years. Anyone that wanted to see Mamash, the Shechina is alive and well. Went and saw this candle is, alive, is, is lit for twenty years. This is the candle. You tell him this is the candle. I was in the yard. It's this, and it's not like uh, oh, it's a it's a game. It's a hoax. You're making it up. They're there. They're watching it. One day, two days, three days, four days. They're not sleeping, but the candle is still going. He had it for decades. Somebody in his level gets a candle. We, but the shame, hopefully, at least get something. But point is, you have to work on your bitachon. A lot of ways to work on your bitachon when it comes to money, when it comes to. Uh, learning Torah and so on, you have to, if you want some ideas, I can give you some, Bezal Hashem, but the point is, work on your bitachon. Next, become an expert in one mitzvah. Pick a mitzvah that you like, pick a mitzvah you don't like, it doesn't really make a difference, become an expert in it. Modesty, Shabbat, wasting seed, pick something, big, small, whatever it is. Become an expert in one mitzvah. This also helps with tikkun abrit. Last couple, mesirut nefesh. Mesirut nefesh for Hashem's sake. Mesirut nefesh is the ultimate fixture of kaun abrit. Rabbi Aaron Rata says, if you do eight things, these eight things, you fix your kaun abrit. Emunat Hashem, Kriyat Shema, Achdut Hashem, Mesirut nefesh. Ahavat Hashem, Kabbalat Mitzvot, look at your tzitzit and think about Yetziat Mitzrayim. You do these eight things, you'll fix your entire Brit. You don't have to do all this list, you do just those eight things. According to Rabbi Ra'on Atta, all of them are included in your Kriyat Shema if you have Kavana, and you can fix your Brit. Ra'ovadi Alav Shalom says that if you want to fix your Brit, whatever you were learning yesterday, double it. If you are learning one daf per day in Gemara, learn two. If you are learning one parasha, learn two. You were learning one page, learn two. You were learning one teilim, learn two. Whatever you did, double it. That's Tikkun Abrit. This Rabotai Karim should answer any people that want to actually fix their Brit. Because if you don't fix it, may Hashem have mercy on you. But unfortunately, nothing else can help you. Nothing else can help you. Go ahead, you had a question, you've been waiting for a while. Ken, that's not part of that we're trying to fix. We're not trying to make more sense. Yes. With the watch, yeah, I mean, in general, a, uh, it's ideal not to have metal on you in general. Even wedding rings for men is not idea. Not a good idea to have at all. Yes. You have another question? Yeah, well, the thing is, though, is that seed is something that is mitamtem adam. People think that wasting seed is not a big deal. They don't realize that the damage that's caused by wasting seed is, aside from it being spiritual in nature, where it ruins the person's olam haba and destroys it and shatters it to pieces, aside from that, a person that wastes seed simply cannot learn Torah like a normal person. Everything they learn, they always get to the wrong conclusion. Everything they learn, they have a hard time understanding. They have a hard time uh, explaining it. They have a hard time repeating it, remembering it. They get to the wrong conclusion on much simple, simple things. Why? Because wasting seed damages your brain, both spiritually and physically. And physically. It's metamtem et adam. And I can tell you from experience, because I'm one of the very few people in the world that talks about this and uh, this subject specifically, I have a lot of people, both Avrechim, Balebatim, regular people, old, young, all types of people that come to me uh, with regards to this addiction uh, for help. And Baruch Hashem, we help them. But I can tell you, the people that have an impossible time to learn Torah, are always, always, without an exception, always wasting seed. People that have a hard time doing tshuva, always because they're wasting seed. If a person is not willing 
to stop wasting seed is tshuva is impossible because he can't his is 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 this he's creating so much tum'ah so much impurity so many demons that are influencing him to do bad it's impossible for him to do enough good to fix it so unless a person stops wasting seed or at least slows it down drastically to the point where it's like random and not on a regular basis like an addiction it's impossible for such a person to do tshuva and the reality is it's possible for them to learn torah without learning torah there's no tshuva there's just uh, mickey mouse games maybe you know there's just no tshuva and i've say i've seen it proven and i have several people that are mamash practically lost causes it's very sad for me to say it because I don't believe that any Jew is a lost cause. I think that even the biggest Rashaim have an opportunity to do tshuva so long as they're alive. But anyone that makes excuses for wasting seed, meaning they're just not going to stop or they're making excuses to continue because they just can't do it or something like that, they are practically, they're virtually a, a, a lost cause. Because any Torah you teach them, they're either not going to remember they're not going to understand. They're going to get to the wrong conclusion. And simply, you're just, it's like talking to a wall actually may do better because the wall is actually going to understand you. There's a neshama in it, and it'll understand every word you say. This person that's wasting seed won't understand two words. Yes, and the walls have neshamot, some of them. That's a different shiur. That's what happens if you continue wasting seed, you go inside a wall. One of the nice things. So, Point is, Rabotai, is that in this parasha, parashat Shmot, one of the symbolic things that you can see that it has to do with seed is that in the beginning of the parasha, it says, Ubnei Yisrael pa'u ve'ishretzu ve'irbu ve'yatzmu ve'me'od me'od ve'temalei ha'aretz otam. Hashem says that the children of Israel were fruitful, teamed, and increased, and became strong, very, very much so, and the land became filled with them. There are six adjectives, six words describing how Am Yisrael grew. And Chazal says six words indicating that each birth was six babies. Showing us that if we really did tshuva, we could become the biggest nation in the world. Not just by Kedusha, but also by number. If we really didn't destroy ourselves, we would be bigger than China. So when a person weighs seed, he's having the exact opposite effect on humanity, on the world, than what he's supposed to. The parasha in parasha Shmot says, we're supposed to increase sixfold, you're destroying it by wasting seed. So Bezat Hashem, this gives us some more ideas of why to stop, why we should stop, why we should stop enticing guys to uh, to look at us because it's not doing you any good. And the reality is, Rabotai, this will help all of us. Do you have any questions? Dying. No, he's a moron. He should have just not did it. Should have just not. He yeah, he could hold himself. He's not an animal. Everybody could hold themselves. But it's it's considered, no, we're not recommending suicide, chas v'shalom, but it's considered arek v'al yavo. It's better that a person dies than make a sin of a sex crime. But a person that can't, you know, hold themselves either has uh, no rabbi or a bad rabbi. There are many ways that you can control yourself if you're a guy. Uh, you know, some of the uh, tzaddikim will say, if it's cold outside, go inside the snow. If, uh, or you could just inflict pain on yourself. Take your nails and pinch yourself in a very sensitive part of your body. Why? You cannot have pain. If you're a normal person, you cannot have pain and pleasure at the same time. If you're normal. If you're not normal, then we, you need help. Uh, then we could help you with it probably. But uh, if you're a normal person, you can't have pleasure and pain at the same time. Um, of course, the Gemara says, first say, Kriyachma. Say, Shema Yisrael, realize there's a God. Then learn Torah. If that doesn't work, think about what's going to happen to you when you go and, and, and you're in, in the grave and the worms are eating you. And then Hashem sends worms specifically in that area. Make sure that you feel it. And the worm is going and eating that part of your body on a regular basis and you feel every single part of that. Every bite. Why? Because Hashem makes sure that you feel every bite. 
So think about things like that that are grotesque and disgusting and painful even to think about. And trust me, that warmness will run away like the, uh, you know, like the goyim run away from us when we do tshuva. But the reality is that if you don't think like that, if you think, no, I like it, oh, I'm used to it, oh, it's hard for me, all the excuses that the Malach HaMavet tells you in your head, then, then you're a lost cause. So you have to think this way. You have to think that it's either your life, you know, it's good or it's bad. It's, it's either destroy your life or it's going to build your life. Um, so, Shema Yisrael, learn Torah, think, think about the day you're going to die. Also, Rabbi Shimon and some of the other Chachamim recommend inflicting pain. Some say uh, pinch yourself. Some say take a needle and pinch yourself. Some say even take a lighter and uh, burn yourself a little bit. Whatever you got to do to stop the pain, stop the, the, the warmness. Cold shower is also very good. Put your, uh, no, put your feet in ice. Chew ice. There's a million and a half things you can do to stop. If you really want to not, if you want to do chew up for this, it's very possible. All you really, really need is desire. Same thing for a woman. If she really wants to do tshuva, she doesn't have to care about the neighbor. She doesn't have to care about the, her mom, her sister, her this, her past, her future. All she cares about is Hashem. And she knows whether I have money or not, Hashem's going to pay for the clothing. Whether I have money or not, Hashem's going to pay for it. Why? It's a mitzvah. Hashem says He's going to pay for it. I'm going to be modest for His people. I'm going to be modest for myself. A person that understands that they live in this world only due to Hashem will find that all of their excuses are a waste of time. There's no excuse. You can do tshuva. It's in your mouth. It's in your lips. It's in your mouth to do. Meaning that you can fulfill the, all, the entire Torah easily. All you really need is desire. Desiring to do good as much as we desire to do bad. It's a choice. It's simply a choice. You decide one day, I don't want to be against Hashem. I don't want to be an enemy of Hashem. I don't want to go to Gainom. I don't want to go to these scary places. And the reality is that if you believe what I'm saying, which is simply repeating what the sages said, what Moshe Rabbeinu said, what Shlomo HaMelech said, if you believe me, as much as you believe some college graduate that just uh, finished med school and is giving you a subscription for some medicine to, to, to get over your cold, you'll do tshuva. Why? Because this guy that just finished college and has uh, half a million dollars in loans that he doesn't even know how he's going to pay back, he gives you a medicine. You're not going to say, are you sure it's going to work? I don't know if I believe you. Is this not poison? Are you trying to kill me? You're not going to ask him those questions. Why? Because he has PhD or DR or something on his business card, automatically you're going to believe him. Automatically you're going to take, oh, he gave him a prescription? Oh, he must know what he's talking about. Why? He went to school for a million years. Well, I promise you, Moshe Rabbeinu went to school for longer. Better school. He went to Hashem. Shlomo Melech went to a better school for longer. Where? He went to Hashem. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon, all these giants, they went to school for a lot longer. They had much better degrees. They're much smarter than this guy. So believe them too. All I'm saying is repeating it. You want the sources, page numbers, you want to look for it for yourself? No problem. I think I mentioned most of the sources. But you want them, I can mention them again. The key is that you have to take this stuff seriously. Don't question things for no reason. Take it at least as seriously as you take the pharmacist. Pharmacist is giving you medicine. Shem is giving you medicine. Sometimes the medicine hurts. Because it comes through a needle. But it's necessary for a little pain in order for you to get the pleasure, in order for you to get the cure. So in the beginning, it's hard to do tshuva. It's hard to change your wardrobe. It's hard to stop uh, you know, being so uncomfortable with yourself. It's hard to change your lifestyle. It's hard to stop looking everywhere like a, uh, you know, some, some type of uh, toy that revolves its head around all the time. It's hard to change yourself. But if you do it, you will have a much better life, not just in Olam Abba, but here. You'll have a much better life. I've seen countless people, Baruch Hashem, that have followed my advice, followed Torah's advice that I mentioned, and their lives have changed drastically. Marriages fixed, uh, you know, relationship fixed, uh, tshuva, Torah, learning, everything you could possibly imagine. Money. It's Torah, it's simple. If you follow it, yes. Uh, 
Absolutely. Guaranteed Gainom. He went straight from the window to Gainom. You can't even say Kaddish on him. Somebody commits suicide, you can't say Kaddish on him. Kaddish can't, can't help them. What? Huh? He's not going to a good place. That's a uh, needless to say. Next. Anybody want to go to Gainom? Raise your hand. Anybody want to go to Kafakela? Raise your hand. Anybody want to go to Gan Eden? Raise your hand. Sunny, Raise your hand. Gan Eden. So, with other Hashem, we do tshuva, we go to Gan Eden, with other Hashem, in this world and the next, Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.